Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Darsh Shah. And I'm Dr. Ultima Shraja. And welcome to Medicine Redefined. A podcast where we will explore the often overlooked but necessary components of health, what we consider to be the fundamentals. We will investigate topics and practices that can give you and your patients the best chance to optimize a healthy lifestyle. It's time to move the needle forward and put the health back in healthcare. Before we get into the show, here's a quick message from Resolve, a physician contract review company. At Resolve, they believe that knowledge is power for physicians and that power gives you control over your financial future. Resolve believes that by mining, analyzing, and synthesizing data, they can provide you with the information and insight that empowers you to diagnose the health of your career, fully understand your worth, and maximize your full potential. As a company founded by a doctor for doctors, Resolve's focus is on the well-being of those whose purpose in life is to care for the well-being of others. To have this incredible company review your employment contract, find them at drpodcastnetwork.com slash resolve. The link is also in the description of this show. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to bring you today's guest, who is Dr. Sean Arndt. He's a professor and chair for the Department of Exercise Science at the University of South Carolina, and also the director of their sports science lab. Dr. Sean Arndt is the past president for the International Society of Sports Nutrition. So in this episode, we dive deep into all things nutrient timing. We discuss some of the common fallacies around nutritional science and how an individualized nutritional approach that fits your lifestyle is likely the best one. Of course, supplementation is a huge part of nutrition. And with his expertise in that realm, we would have been remiss not to discuss that. So we do touch upon that as well. Now, there are some parts where we get into the biochemistry of nutrition, but Dr. Arndt does a great job simplifying the complexities of this topic with respect to human physiology. Darsh and I had so much fun geeking out with Dr. Arndt, and we hope you will enjoy this episode as much as we did. So without further delay, please enjoy our conversation with Dr. Sean Arndt. All right, guys, uh, today we have Dr. Sean Arndt. Uh, Dr. Arndt, thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, before we jumped on here, uh, we were talking a little bit about what we've been up to, what you've been up to. And um, as I mentioned earlier, when, when we wanted to get you on, on this show, uh, there are so many ways we can go down because you have expertise in different realms of sports science and performance exercise physiology. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, I think, touch on all of those things. Uh, but before we, we get there, um, why don't you tell uh, our audience a little bit about um, what, you know, got you to where you are today and, the, you know, what interested you to get in this field? Yeah. And first of all, guys, thanks for having me on. And for, for the listeners, understand that, uh, that Alt was one of my interns at Rutgers back in the day. So it is particularly awesome for me to see one of my former students go on and be doing big things. Uh, and it really is my honor to, to be on here and get to talk to you at this professional level to see the things that you guys have accomplished. So um, I couldn't ask for anything more as a professor, you know, to see what you guys have accomplished and what you're continuing to do and, and educate. Um, you know, it warms my heart, but it's just, it's just cool to see, right? And I'm glad that you didn't hate me enough that you didn't even want me on your show, right? So who knows, I'll get ambushed here at some point. Um, so what got me here? So I was, <laughs> I guess sort of the way I look at it, I, I was a jock that happened to be good at science, Right. So that was really um, sport for me was was my world, um, you know, and, and from playing in college, um, you know, my my area, I, you know, for me, soccer has been very, very good to me. Uh, I wound up being with the national staff for U.S. soccer for the better part of 17 years, um, you know, working with the national teams, coaching development, the, the coaching schools and education process. So I did my master's. I undergraduate at University of Virginia uh, and then I did my master's and Ph.D. at Arizona State. In exercise science. And actually, uh, when I finished up at Arizona State, the position I got was an assistant professor at Rutgers University. And so I was at Rutgers for 17 years, um, had the, the pleasure of going through the tenure process, promotion to full professor. And, and it was, it was, you know, it was really a learning process and a great growth opportunity. And about six years ago now, six, yeah, I guess it was about six or seven years ago now, I had the opportunity to create the Center for Health and Human Performance there. And so that was a big turning point for us. Um, we, you know, we, we, we partnered very closely with Quest Diagnostics to really start ratcheting up what we were doing in, in biochemistry and endocrinology and, and the biomarker work that we were able to take off with. But, you know, we had the pleasure of working very closely with a couple of the athletic teams there, most notably uh, men's and women's soccer. Uh, and really those last five, six years there, 
the, the run we had with women's soccer was remarkable and they were just such a great program to work with. Um, and it was a real opportunity to take what we do as scientists and put it into a real world setting, right? Because a lot of the research that happens in, in optimizing athletic performance or overtraining and overreaching and stuff like that is often done in a very contrived fashion in the lab, right? We bring somebody in for a few weeks, jack up their volume. Oh, does it suck? Like how much do you break down? There is nothing like a high level athlete because you realize, you know, this was a top 10 team. And actually one of the years we worked with them was the first year they went to the final four, you know, so you're talking about an elite team. Um, and we had them over entire seasons. So we had four or five months worth of data looking at training load, recovery, biomarkers, especially in female athletes. Do you know how rare that is? And so to, to understand that and, and, and the female physiology that went with it, but to also see them succeed as our research progressed and to be able to put it into practice for the following year or even in that year, I think was really one of the highlights of my career. So then in 2019, um, I was very, very fortunate to be offered the department chair position at the University of South Carolina. Uh, we are the top ranked program in the country. We have the top doctoral program. Uh, we are one of the top 13 sports science programs in the entire world. Uh, and we are the top sports science university in the United States. Um, so for me, it was just an opportunity that I, I couldn't say no to. And it is such an incredible environment here. Uh, once I got here, we created the, the U of SC Sports Science Lab, which we now have up and running. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with athletics here already. They are just an amazing group to work with. Talk about not territorial. Um, they want to win. You got SEC athletes, you know, like it, it's awesome. You know, so we've got that going. My, my lab staff is absolutely first rate uh, between my doctoral students, master's students and my postdoc. Um, but, you know, that that kind of gets me to this point. And, you know, now we've got a grant with the Marine Corps. We're doing stuff with the Army. So now we're taking a lot of the human performance work that we've been doing on the athlete side and turning it to the tactical athlete uh, and looking at sort of national defense and readiness issues and stuff like that. So it's a nice transition, but it sort of fits right in with with what we do. My background's endocrinology. Um, you know, so that's been the, the basis of much of what we do. And a lot of what my research revolves around is stress. So it's looking at the stress response. It's looking at buffering stress, optimizing stress. Without stress, we don't grow, right? So it's how do we find that 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 fine line between um, you know optimal training and overtraining in terms of pushing the boundaries. And I'm one of those people that you know we hear a lot about like minimal effective dose, but I've never really bought into that concept unless you also know maximal tolerable dose. Because if you're working in an athletic population, you got to know where the breakout point is too and the breakdown point. Because if you just work with minimal effective dose, you're also going to get minimal effective metals. Um, so <laughs> you got to know what boundaries you can push to, to optimize that, that performance world um, as we get through. But we've also worked with like adolescent cancer survivors. We've done some obesity work. And performance to me transcends all of that. It, 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 what, what's what's performance to an Olympic marathoner might not be the same thing that's performance to an elderly individual that needs to be able to function daily, but it's still performance to them, you know. And so those are the things that we really try to gravitate towards and keep in mind. Wow, you know that is that is phenomenal. Um, there's just so much you're doing. You're a man of many hats. It seems like you're you're very passionate about what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I do love what I do. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely, I am blessed to do what I do. I, I yeah. really, um, you know, I, my preference would have been to be, to be a pro athlete. There weren't as many opportunities and I'm short. Um, so, you know, at the pro level, um, you know, power wise and stuff, I was good. But, uh, you know, for me to be able to still stay around this world and now to really be able to contribute on the military research side, I grew up in the Marine Corps household. Um, so to me, it's, it's, a, it's an easy, natural fit. And something that I feel very good about. And honestly, that my lab is just super excited about. Like these kids are geeked to, to be able to get into this world. And, and as well as with some of the teams we're working with at South Carolina, it's remarkable. Hold on, Doctor. I think you're selling yourself a little bit short because I'm pretty sure you're a Division One college football player. Am I, am I right? Soccer, yeah. So Soccer, were, excuse me. Okay. There right. were national titles at Virginia while I was there. So it's, That's right. That's right. Okay. But, but no. it, it's funny. You know, it's hilarious. So sometimes with some of the teams I've worked with, I've got a PhD. I was 2017 sports scientist of the year. I'm a department chair. They are typically far more impressed by national titles and playing at a, at a, at a top school than they are with any of that. So I just roll with it. No, 
okay. The, you know, the, there you go. And it's all good. So yeah, it's pretty funny. You know, and, and that's what's interesting, right? You kind of touched on this this idea of minimal effective dose and, and maximum tolerable dose, right? I think that you know, uh, probably a few years back, maybe not even a few years back, over the last couple of decades, there's this idea that if some is good, more is better, right? So, and then and then now, as of late, people are understanding, okay, that's not what it's about. Maybe it's more about minimal effective dose. And then there's this pendulum. And Darsha and I always talk about this pendulum that swings back and forth. And what you're trying to see is you got to know what the extremes are. And then we try to find a sweet spot for every single person. We try to individualize it. And yeah, this is this was a struggle that we had, and, and you know, because we could go so many day, uh, ways. But one thing I don't know if you mentioned or not, you were also the president of the International Sports Society of Nutrition. Yeah. Right? So yeah, obviously you were extremely well versed in that, and you know, again, this is something a new project that we've started. And when we look at medicine, one of the foundational components is nutrition. So I think that probably that's where we want to start today. Um, and what, when I look at nutrition, when I'm giving counseling and, you know, in my fitness background, people come to me about what's important. There's three components. We look into it, right? We look at quality, quantity, and timing. Yep. I think that everybody can agree that quality is definitely the most important one. And then the, the, the latter two are, are something that, you know, uh, maybe the 20% of effort should be going in there. Uh, yet the question that I most often get from my family, close friends is about nutrient timing. Sure. I know you've been on uh, a couple of position papers by the ISSN about this, so you've written well about this. So um, I think that that's probably where that we should start. What, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. let's go. Let's delve into that because I'll, I'll tell you, even from personal experience, you know, I got into lifting probably around like 18 years old, right? So about about 10 years of experience now that I have, and I would go through. Okay, it's pre workout. I got to get a meal. Um, Post workout, that anabolic window that we always hear about, 30 minutes. I got to get home and get that protein shake in. But then some research came out and I said, okay, maybe I should work out fasted. And then should I wait to eat uh, maybe an hour or two, like growth hormone or, you know, some other biomarkers kind of creep up so that I can optimize. So what is the current research telling us? What have you found? So, um, so great questions. And there's a lot we can talk about here. One thing, let me start off with this though, Alt, to come back to something you said, um, that, that, uh, quality, uh, pretty much supersedes everything. I will say this though, with enough quantity of even subpar nutrients, you can still meet your needs, right? So in other words, quality and quantity go hand. Because like, for example, I could eat um, uh, all whey protein, right? Iso whey, right? But if I only eat like 40 grams of it a day, I'm not getting anywhere. So so the quality and quantity go hand in hand. And what I would argue, and to kind of set the stage, I usually kind of end with this when we talk about this stuff, but I think it's appropriate to address it up front. Think of it like baking a cake, okay? If... If the quantity and the quality are the foundation of the cake, the timing becomes the icing. All right. So you don't start with the icing, even if it's the tasty part, you know, especially on carrot cake. Um, but, you know, when you start to put these things together, you've got to bake the cake first. Then you put the icing on. So I can time the crap out of whatever I want to. But if I don't eat enough of it, it's not going to do me any good. Right. So I think that that timing aspect becomes important when you take care of the other stuff. And so to me, I think that this has unfortunately, especially in like the fitness and bodybuilding world, almost been treated as like an either or, you know, is is quantity important or is timing important? And I look at it as quantity is important and timing is important, you know, so it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, but you do have to take care of the big movers first. You know, and I think that, you know, whether I'm working with an athlete, whether we're working with tactical operators, whether we're working with uh, general population, pick the low hanging fruit, right? Go after the big movers first, the things that will make the biggest bang for the buck, the biggest dent in whatever you're trying to do, then you can fill in around it. But here's the thing, like if you take, if you take somebody like Darsh, you said, you know, you started working out at like 18, right? So if I take somebody who's never really lifted before, man, I could time the crap out of their protein intake post-workout. The big needle mover there is the workout. That's the stimulus. You know, you could do damn near anything to them and they're going to make some progress because it's a novel stimulus. So the timing aspect starts to become a bit more critical or maybe impactful when you start to get a little farther down the road, right? And you're looking for that one, two, three percent difference. But that being said, there's even some data on on um, on protein pacing in terms of how you feed throughout the day that becomes important. So I think that one of the most important aspects of, t- of nutrient timing is understanding what it encompasses. And I think that when the whole field started, 
it was a bit of that that anabolic window idea, right? And so it's this notion that, and it was it was honestly it was very good work by John Ivy, uh, you know, back in the eighties and nineties where they were looking at this effect. And so we all said, oh my god, we got to eat right after we work out. That's the key. And they're not wrong. It's just that what we've come to understand is that window is more like a garage door, right? It's a lot bigger than we thought. So it's not like after a half hour, oh crap, there go all my gains, right? Like that's not the way it works. But unfortunately, some have treated it like, well, then I don't need to eat right after because I've got all this time. I looked at it very different way from a pragmatic standpoint. And especially if I'm working with an athlete, um, (laughs) I'm going to use that garage door to fit as many meals in there as I can. In other words, instead of waiting, why not take advantage of the fact that you have anabolic upregulation for an extended period to metabolize more of those foods that you're trying to take into the body, right? So in other words, your repair window just got that much better. So rather than going, eh, I don't need to eat, it's like, hey, why not though? And especially, you know, if you're working with somebody who trains multiple times a day, where we saw this in particular, here's a really good example. If you work with anybody that does MMA, right? If you're working with, with any kind of fighter, because they don't typically just have one training session a day because they train in multiple disciplines and multiple um, skill sessions throughout the day. If I don't eat right after one of those, I'm going to suffer later. You know, and I think that's where the timing aspect becomes important. And the other thing too, is there's some really cool research that's come out within the last year that's actually shown that skipping breakfast impacts performance later in the day. So you're talking like at afternoon, evening, you, even after they fed the same number of calories. So if you, if you still eat the same amount as if you would have had breakfast, but you account for it throughout the rest of the day, skipping breakfast has a negative impact on performance later because of the way our bodies adjust to this and because of circadian rhythms and the, the overall impacts. And so, you know, when we start to look at it, you know, it, it really becomes a much more holistic thing. So what I've come to appreciate more than anything else is timing is not just post-workout. Timing is also pre-workout and timing is also during the workout and timing is also before sleep and timing is also when you wake up. So in other words, timing extends itself throughout the day. What we can probably do is just maybe identify where those few real sweet spots are to make the biggest impact with it. But really it's, it's a daily process to be able to do this. So once you account for total protein intake, for example, how it's used throughout the rest of the day and how you feed that throughout the day becomes a little bit more important. And I think the other thing that we do have to understand here is there's been a quite a bit of work that's really protein timing that's been confused with nutrient timing. In other words, protein is a nutrient, but it's not all of them. So when we look at carbohydrate and fat and hell, even some supplements, when you look at timing of creatine and things like that, caffeine, right? Those are timing issues as well. So nutrients extend beyond just one particular macronutrient. Yeah, Dr. Art, I, I love that. So, I mean, to me, obviously, what you're saying is context matters, right? Are you talking about a teenager who's never actually exercised before versus an elite athlete at the Olympic level, maybe at the national, uh, you know, the, some of the soccer or cyclists that you've worked with? Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to try to go for those big movers again. But I definitely want to talk a little bit later about the circadian rhythms and, you know, skipping breakfast and performance later on. But you you mentioned the anabolic window post-training, right? Um, we know that obviously cortisol is going to be mobilized. So you can mobilize energy. Cortisol is going to spike through the workout. But at the same time, you want that to be suppressed as soon as possible afterwards so you can get into that anabolic window. Um, I'm sure the work, the, the type of training you do matters, right? Whether you're going 405 for 10 versus just an endurance exercise. Um, why, how long do you think that anabolic window is technically the, or the garage door, we should say. Um, and then is it because of upregulation of growth hormone, insulin? What is it? It, it, So insulin is going to play a role in terms of the impact of carbohydrate intake at that point, right? Because what's going to happen. And, and I would probably argue it may be a little less about insulin and more about GLUT4, right? So if GLUT4 translocation occurs with physical activity. So what's happening is in some ways you've primed your body for, for glucose uptake to convert to glycogen uh, resynthesis when you're done because of GLUT4. But at the same time, you get a nice double whammy here because if you eat carbohydrate after, you also increase insulin, which further increases GLUT4. So now you've you've shortened that time frame for the need to replenish glycogen. Now I will say this, for most people, like so if we take a weight training workout, it's not glycogen depleting, maybe 50% depletion. On the other hand, if I take a soccer match, there was work done by Bank Saltine back in the 70s where they showed as much as 95 to 98% glycogen depletion in a soccer match. 
Okay. Now, the reason that becomes important is for somebody with weight training, I'm not going to sit here and say, if you don't eat carbohydrate right after, you are completely screwing yourself. No, honestly, if you eat enough carbohydrate throughout the rest of the day, within 24 hours, you'll be replenished. All right. It's, it's not particularly hard. But does that mean that it doesn't make sense to eat it right after? No, actually, in that case, why not? Like, you know, if it, it, here, here's, here's something that we can kind of consider going through this whole thing. If it helps or doesn't hurt, do it. <laughs> you know, so it's like I've never understood the resistance to some of this. But um, in terms of, you know, Darsh, you had mentioned and, and then and all, you just brought it back up, the growth hormone idea, right? So, hey, so if you don't eat right away, you know, with, with growth hormone increase, will food suppress it? Guys, here's the deal. That acute growth hormone response is fairly useless. In other words, it's going to be the, the the pulsatile nature of growth hormone and the signaling that occurs otherwise. Your primary impetus for um, uh, hypertrophy and, and muscle remodeling is really going to be mTOR activation, right? So you're getting that through the loading. Growth hormone can play a role in this, but growth hormone kind of throughout the day is going to be more important. And here's the thing. If you're in a depleted state, you can't be anabolic. I don't care what the growth hormone level is. You've not created an environment to repair and resynthesize muscle, right? So if that's your ultimate goal, that's important. And the other thing too is, you know, we also probably have to understand the difference between adaptation and optimization. So if I'm competing in a match, we want optimization, right? We want me to be at my best, optimally fueled, ready to go. Adaptation can be uncomfortable at times, right? So there may be a time where I train in a carb depleted state. Your system gets used to that. We get mitochondrial biogenesis. That can potentially help as well, right? Doesn't mean I want to do it every day. It doesn't want to mean I, I want to train in an impaired state on a regular basis. But at the same time, discomfort, again, kind of back to that whole stress idea, right? Like how do I manage it? Um, that can be useful in the training process. Uh, ice baths are a perfect example of this. Okay. So from an acute standpoint, if I'm in a tournament or I'm in a hot, hot climate, we know that ice baths can reduce feelings of soreness. They can help with uh, readiness to return to play. However, there's research that shows that ice baths will also decrease adaptation and will actually impair muscle hypertrophy. So it depends on whether you're playing the short game or the long game. Are you just trying to get ready for the next practice or are you trying to get ready for the season? Right. And that's ultimately where your decisions about what you do after and the, the recovery modalities that you typically use start to become really important in how we consider this. But at the end of the day, that replenishment post exercise, there's really no advantage to delaying it. The only advantage to delaying it is with some of the work that James E. Morton and his group have done looking at carb restricted training. They've done it mostly in cyclists, um, and what they found is that – so what they would do is they would do like two sessions in one day, and then after the evening session, uh, especially a high-intensity session, they wouldn't replenish carbohydrate. Then they would have them do like a steady-state training session the next morning, um, but here's where people confuse that with fasted cardio is with the studies where they actually showed a performance improvement doing that, they still fed them protein in the morning. Right, because now you're preventing that muscle breakdown to provide the raw materials in order for these other uh, fueling sources to be able to be available. And then what they would do it after that morning session is then they would refeed carbohydrate. All right, and what they found is an upregulation in mitochondria, uh, some modest performance improvements. So there's a time place, but even that wasn't done every day. That was like two or three days a week, you know. And so that somehow, much like the whole. You don't have to eat protein right after a workout turned into don't eat protein right after a workout. Same thing with carb-restricted training turned into fasted cardio. You know, and it, there's no evidence for that. So the timing aspect in that window, I think, are, are something that we can look at. But, you know, how long is that window? I'd probably say a few hours. Um, we could probably argue up to eight hours easily that you could see an upregulation in anabolic capacity because of that resistance training workout. Um, that doesn't mean you want to wait eight hours to eat. It just means that now within that eight hours, you got some opportunities to refeed, promote resynthesis and actually get the most adaptation possible in that case. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That was a great explanation. It's been 20 minutes and I'm already, I'm, 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 I'm learning my head off here. Um, can you, can you really quickly, just for like the lay people out there who might be listening to this or even some medical students, can you just quickly explain like basic biochemistry of insulin, GLUT4, how it just kind of works? All right, so so GLUT4 or GLUT4 transporters in particular are an insulin-dependent transporter 
with one exception. They also translocate to the cell surface uh, with physical activity, right? So with muscle mobilization. What GLUT4 is responsible for is basically, for lack of a better way of putting it, pulling glucose into the muscle, okay? We also have GLUT2, 3, and 5 that operate throughout different organs as well as the brain. The nice thing with the brain one, it's a non-insulin dependent transporter. You definitely don't want that to be reliant on insulin. But at the muscular level, it's insulin dependent with the exception of physical activity. So what happens is we have our circulating blood glucose, right? Your blood sugar. And ideally, we're going to be able to use that as a fuel. We can transport that into the muscle cell. Otherwise, it can go through actually triglyceride resynthesis fairly easily as well uh, if you're not using it for that. So what's going to happen is when activity starts, the higher the intensity of the activity, the more we rely on endogenous carbohydrate sources, in other words, glycogen what's stored in the muscle because of blood flow changes, because of changes in transport capabilities, and because of changes in, in bioenergetics, um, using glucose for fuel becomes a lot harder to do. So we're really relying on glycogen. So moral of the story is make sure you're topped off before you start, right? That you, if you start in a glycogen depleted state, you're already pretty screwed. So what happens then is throughout this and through low to moderate intensity exercise, we can, we can bring this glucose into the muscle cell, shuttle it through glycolysis, and then on through oxidative phosphorylation if we're doing aerobic exercise, right? So it depends on what we need it for and what fuel source is going to be our primary. The higher the intensity, the more carbohydrate we need for fuel, and the more that's going to be glycogen rather than just glucose. What happens is once activity is done and the muscle is going, feed me, Right, like I, I, I used up my 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 carbohydrate source. I've used up my glycogen. Feed me. So what happens is that GLUT four can basically help bring that glucose into the cell and store it as glycogen because now we're not in breakdown mode. We're in repair mode. So now glycogen synthase is more active. So we can keep that in place. And so now we can keep the glycogen where it needs to be. We'll bring water in, in with that as well. It's also one of the reasons why creatine uh, ingestion post-workout may be a little bit better than pre-workout because you're actually taking advantage of it coming in with the carbohydrate as well, right? So it's kind of pulling everything in in order to feed the muscle. The same, the other thing we have going on at this time though is, is and throughout the, the training period is lactate is also being converted as a fuel source, right? Lactate's an excellent fuel source. It so often gets confused as a waste product. And by the way, people, please stop talking about lactic acid. It's, it's gone. Like it, it turns over really, really quickly. That's not why you get a burn during your workout. Um, so Unless they have significant kidney abnormalities or some type of muscle disease. Exactly. That, that's, and that's it, but that's a different story. So yeah. but what we're talking about is an otherwise healthy individual. And so once you start changing kidney dynamics, you've changed all kinds of parameters in the first place, right? And so what we're looking at is, is clearance capabilities and stuff like that. But I will say it's interesting you bring up the kidney point. It's kind of, well, I don't want to say it's kind of cool because like in-stage renal disease sucks. That's not what I mean by this. But even now with what we know about protein, we're realizing that even some of the, the myths and misconceptions about high protein is hard on the kidneys really is not bearing out. Like if you look at a preponderance of the research, it does not support that. But in a kidney patient, if you do have kidney disease, you do need to pay attention to what your protein intake is. But even then, it doesn't look like it needs to be as low as was originally thought because realize too that if you're not feeding the muscle, you're also now further losing function when you're talking about physiological adaptation. So that's a concern that we have to be aware of as well. And especially if we want somebody, and we do, to maintain an active lifestyle through this process. All right. But anyway, so, you know, when we're looking at this overall in terms of the bioenergetic pathways and, and how we're going to use that, that carbohydrate, um, you know, that probably Darsh, that in a nutshell is kind of the, my like overly simplified version of, um, GLUT4 processing, the role that insulin plays, by the yeah. way, insulin's a super anabolic hormone in, in the mm -hmm. sense that it's the whole job is storage, right? It's, you could probably argue it's our most anabolic hormone. IGF one's right up there too. Um, but it just, it, it just, it, it's good at storage. I mean, it really is. That's its whole job. Um, you know, and the way when I teach exercise endocrinology, we can probably wrap it up with the following. When you exercise, all your hormones go up except for insulin, which goes down done. Right. So that's basically, <laughs> that's basically like the, the very dumbed down version of endocrinology. There's a cliff uh, notes right there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so just for all those things, we're pretty good. Uh, and the higher the intensity, the more the others go up and the more insulin comes down. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of the, the overall process that we'd be looking at there.
Okay. So I I, I want to ask about glycogens because you mentioned being preloaded before being like going to a workout. I've heard people say, oh, I want to work out fasted because once my glycogen's depleted, I tap into my fat reserves and now I can lose weight or I lose fat. How does that play a role into all this? So I think the first most important thing is just because you're using fat for fuel doesn't mean you're losing fat, right? So at the end of the day, it comes into caloric deficit. Um, and actually real quick segue, because I think this is important too. Calories in, calories out is a real thing, right? Thermodynamics. However, where I think we've missed the boat and where people um, have a misconception of this, it's not necessarily calories in in terms of what you eat, calories out in terms of expenditure. It's calories in in terms of what you absorb and then calories out, right? Because there's a whole part of the digestive process. There's, there's two studies that I think are really cool, the, the peanut butter sandwich study and the cheese sandwich study. So the peanut butter sandwich study, what they did is they fed whole peanuts – peanut powder or peanut butter. And what they found is that the metabolizable energy was less with the whole peanuts. In other words, it cost you some energy to metabolize that. So the more you process and pound down and change a food source, the more you absorb it, right? So now there's more calories absorbed, less spent in digestion. The other one was the cheese sandwich study, right? So the cheese sandwich study, what they did is they either used all like whole unprocessed cheese and unprocessed bread. And by the way, these are all calorie matched or highly processed white bread with like American cheese, right? Highly processed cheese. And the processed sandwich did not cost you as many calories to process, to, to absorb, right? So in other words, you kept more of the calories from the processed sandwich than you did the whole food sandwich. So again, same calories. And it's not, people will use this to say, oh, see, it's not calories in calories out. That doesn't make sense. And it's like, no, it does. We're just looking at the wrong intake. We need to look at what happens at the level of the gut not just at the level of the mouth, because it's that metabolizable energy that starts to make the difference in terms of how we account for this. So actually, you know, in many ways, all that's back to your point about quality being so important. There you go. That's part of the reason why, right? Because even fiber is going to change metabolizable energy when you take it as a whole food source along with other things. Um, so back to the glycogen question uh, in terms of loaded and fasted. So here's the thing. Just because you are in fat burning mode really doesn't mean you're going to lose any more weight. As a matter of fact, none of the research supports that. Just it's not the way it works. Um, you know, with high intensity work where it's mostly carbohydrates being used, guess what? You still lose weight. And so the question comes from where the stores come from. But the, the catch is if you think about fueling for the work necessary, the higher the intensity, the more it relies on carbohydrates. So here's the deal. For you to exist in a fat burning state, right, where you're mostly using fat for fuel as a high percentage, your intensity has to be much lower by default. You can't use glycolysis for that. That's not how fat goes into that. It's not converted readily for that purpose. You've got to be relying on oxidative phosphorylation. And oh, by the way, to some degree, when you look at the overall, especially with the TCA cycle, realize that oxaloacetate is a carbohydrate derived intermediate. So for that all to actually work to burn more fat, if that's your intake source or your input source, you actually still can utilize carbohydrate to help that process. So, so it's, it's definitely one of those things that I think we've gotten too caught up in what's the fuel you're burning and that equals what you're losing. It still comes down to energy balance to a great degree. Um, and so, yeah, I, I get the whole, like, I'm not going to eat before because then I tap into more fat burning, but yeah, but mm -hmm. your workout can't be as high intensity. And honestly, there's not a big advantage to it. If that's your preference, so in other words, if you just don't feel good on a fuller stomach or if you eat something before, okay, I can kind of understand that. But don't for a minute think that it's helping your necessarily weight loss goals. That's, that's not really what it's doing. It's, it's more of a preference at that point. But you know, by and large, hey, at, at the very least, if somebody's going to do that, at the very least, eat protein beforehand because at least it helps spare muscle. Um, and it's not going to impair your fat burning capability if that's really what you're gearing towards. Uh, but, but those would be the things that I would probably focus on at that point. Yeah. I love that Dr. Arndt. And, and, and I think that, you know, obviously when you talk about nutrition science, it, it tends to be a very polarizing topic, right? And part of it, I mean, more so than almost anything else. Um, and, and part of it is all these fad diets and whatnot. I remember us maybe what a decade ago when we were in exercise uh, physiology class talking about how Atkins diet, uh, maybe 20, 25 years was super popular. And now then it became keto. Yep. And I've been listening to more and more about, you know, athletes, elite athletes talking about being fat adapted. 
after being in, in keto for a while. Um, you know, most recently I was listening to the Ready State and I think Mark Sisson was on there from Mark's Daily Apple. You probably know him. Um, he was talking about metabolic switching and stuff. And, and as of late, uh, you know, at least in the fitness industry, maybe I want to say eight to 10 years ago, uh, intermittent fasting and time restricted eating were a big thing. Yeah. And finally, I think the whether fortunately, unfortunately, the medical literature is kind of catching up to it, um, although it's still pretty young uh, in terms of, you know, its effects on weight loss and cardio cardiovascular uh, disease and those types of things. Um, and then obviously lean body mass type stuff. But I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on this idea of fat adapt, fat ad- adaptation and then metabolic switching. So you're going to burn primarily what you eat. Okay. So if you eat a high fat diet, your primary output source for fuel is going to be fat. Here's the catch though. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Right. So if you're fat adapted, so what it comes down to is um, the kind of work you want to try to do. There is, I will, let me put it this way there is not a single study that has shown a ketogenic diet to be better for performance than even a moderate carbohydrate diet. And, and so, and let me back up for one second. Just because you're anti keto for athletes does not mean you're pro high carb. All right. I am a big fan of carbohydrate periodization. It depends on what you're fueling for. It doesn't mean you just sit around and eat Twinkies all day. That's not the point, right? It's not the Pop-Tart diet versus the avocado diet. That's not the way it works. And so the fat adaptation, here's the thing, you know, um, maybe this is be a really good example for where quote unquote fat adaptation is not always ideal. So the concept of the ketogenic diet in the military has been popular lately in terms of how they can use it because they see weight loss. And even, even in the military, obesity is a big problem. So they've been talking about this and the fact that uh, they've seen that divers can stay down longer on a ketogenic diet because of what happens with ketones for brain fuel and yada, yada, yada. So they've talked about, hey, maybe with our with, with special, special forces, if we've got them out in the field and we fuel them ketogenically, like we put them on a ketogenic diet, their fuel, like what they have to carry with them isn't as heavy, right? Fats lighter when you consider like per gram when you're thinking about energy. Here's the problem. All right. I was on a, a panel a few years ago um, with, with SOCOM and one of the master chiefs from the SEALs had made the comment when the dietitians were saying, what can we do to help you? Like, what do you need? And he goes, picture the most austere environment possible where what we need help with is learning how to properly butcher and cook a goat that we have to buy from a local village because we're out on mission and we will make mission. And that always stuck with me because here's the thing ketogenic diet only works for that fat adaptation as long as you stay ketogenic. So what do you do when you're in the field and you need to eat whatever you can get your hands on, right? Now you're kicked out of ketosis. Oh crap. The other thing too is I always find it funny from a ketogenic proponent standpoint that no study is long enough. That's the problem, right? Oh, keto adaptation takes four months and you only did three months and three weeks. So then somebody does four months. No, nah, it's more like four months in one week. So I, I'm kind of convinced that if you're pro keto, the, 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 the study needs to be N plus one of whatever the longest ketogenic study has been. Luis Burke over in Australia has done an amazing work with the supernova studies. They used Olympic race walkers, aerobic sport, truly high level. These are Olympic caliber people and performance was decreased on a ketogenic diet. It's that simple. All right. And I guess the way I look at it too, is if keto adaptation takes, you know, f- let's say four months, let's be nice. We'll go four months, even though even in Luis's stuff, they've shown it takes about a week to two weeks. All right. But let's, let's give them benefit of that four months. If I'm working with a pro team and let's use hockey as an example from when I worked with the devils. All right. Um, let's say they make the Stanley cup. They're playing into June. They're reporting back in late August, early September for camp, July, August, September, maybe not even three months. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift somebody's diet. That's going to cost me performance during those three months of off season in order to put them on something that's never been found to be better than the diet they were on. That just doesn't make sense. The other thing too, is if you want anything, metabolic flexibility, the ability to utilize whatever fuels are available. You know how you do that? You eat a multiple nutrient diet right? (laughs) Your body gets used to using these things because you perform under these different environments and demands. And it's funny because even some diets are promoted for their metabolic flexibility. Hey, I hate to like burst everybody's bubble, but everybody must have missed one really basic physiological fact. The human body was designed to be metabolically flexible. 
right? We can use proteins and fats and carbohydrates. So unless there's a, like a fourth macronutrient that I'm unaware of, I might argue for bourbon or maybe coffee. We might be able to throw five in there actually, right? Bourbon and coffee. I'm going to argue for coffee. Definitely. Yeah. I got you with bourbon. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. See, okay. So we've got five macronutrients. You should probably put water in there somewhere. Just, you know, (laughs) yes. Yes. Um, but but overall, when we look at it from that standpoint, the, the flexibility pattern is, you know, (laughs) here's the problem is so we've got, I've actually done a talk on the paleo keto vegan macro fasting diet, right? So it's like you take all of the fad diets, you put them. So do they work? So that's one big question, right? So one of the things we have to sort of decipher when we start talking about this kind of stuff is the difference between can we and should we, can we lose weight on these diets? The answer is yes. And it is almost always for the exact same reason, because you reduce energy intake. That is Plain and simple. Intermittent fasting, turns out you never fully compensate when you have that non-eating window. Even if you're at liberty to eat in those other eight hours, you never fully make it up. And then intermittent fasting gets fun because there's all kinds of versions of it, right? There's the 5-2, there's the 16-8, like blah, blah, blah. Like take your pick, right? So it's like, which one are you talking about? Um, so that becomes part of the problem. Ketogenic diet, usually because of satiety, you wind up not eating as much. There's nothing magic about it. It's not like there's like calorie fairies that suddenly don't count because it's, it's fat. It doesn't work that way. Um, you know, when you look at the paleo diet, it's funny. It's based on this assumption that, that our ancestors didn't have modern diseases. They were hunter gatherers. Hey, guess what? They didn't live long enough to have heart disease and cancer. They were dead by 30 because they had eaten by a saber tooth tiger. Right. So, and the thing is, guess what? They hunted for all of their own food. They gathered it. So as you drove down to the supermarket to go get your, your ground beef, your, your grass fed ground beef and everything else, like you didn't go hunter gather, you went and bought. Right. So there's all these other factors that we miss. And oh, by the way, when we talk about what our ancestors ate, Hey, hate to break it to you. It depended on what part of the world they were in. We're now finding that actually in the middle East, they ate grains. And do you think for a minute if you would have offered Captain Caveman a loaf of bread, he would have turned his nose up at it because he was like, no, that's going to kill me. No, it would have been like, I don't have to go find food today. This is amazing, right? So we adapt to what's available. And so even from a vegan and vegetarian standpoint, there are some advantages with BMI and certain blood markers. But more than anything, the strongest argument for those diets is really more ethical. If somebody has a problem with eating animal protein – that's fine. Just be, be upfront about it. But in terms of demonizing it or, or, you know, we know that the plant-based proteins overall are not as good, right? They're, they're, they're not complete, but can you make a diet out of it? Absolutely. But you better know what you're doing. And you typically need to eat a little more protein, probably about 20% more to account for the differences in absorption too, because of the amount of fiber in the diet and the amount of carbohydrate. So for some people, they actually may have a little bit of difficulty losing weight on those diets because of potentially the extra calories they eat to get enough protein in because of what they're eating for carbohydrate. Again, not to demonize any of them, but I think your your point all in terms of um, how polarizing it is, I look at it this way. To me, there are three things that are some of the most polarizing factors in, in human society, religion, politics, nutrition. Can you think of it? people identify themselves as Democrat, Republican, independent? Then we've got on the on the, on the you know the the religion side, you've got Catholic, Jewish, uh, Baptist, you, you know, Buddhist, whatever you want to do. And then we have what else can you think of where people literally identify themselves by saying, "I'm keto, I'm paleo, I'm vegan." Like they literally their self identity is tied into that diet. So here's what I did. My wife and I actually came up with a diet since people like names, right? And instead of if it fits your macros, paleo, keto, any of those, it's help. Let's try this one, right? Because people really like names. If it fits your lifestyle. In other words, eat mostly whole foods, enjoy your life. Don't diet away your time with people. Eat things in moderation. Start with protein, fill in around it, depending on your energetic demands, train hard, and enjoy it, right? If it fits your lifestyle, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish and you're fueling for the work necessary. You know, but if you start with some basic principles, I know it's not sexy and people are like, oh, well, that can't work because that's just too, you know, common sense. Um, That's exactly what it is. And unfortunately, we we overcomplicated it for the sake of sales and fads and something being catchy and all this stuff. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to the same basic principles. Eat high quality foods, 
you can, I, and by the way, the other thing that I hate is when people talk about, oh, you know, your cheat day and this, that. No, it makes it sound like you're doing something wrong. If there's something you want to eat and you enjoy it in moderation, freaking eat it. You're not cheating on your diet. And also, you don't have to eat clean. Like, what does that mean? You wash your hands before every meal, which, by the way, during COVID is a really good idea. Um, but, you know, by and large, it's like eat mostly whole foods. Supplements have a place because, honestly, if you're looking for more rapid um, mTOR activation post-workout, protein powders are going to be better than eating a steak. It just gets into the system faster. That's the reality. So, you know, again, it's, it's time and place. And I think you use the word that I think is the single most important one when we talk about all this stuff, which is context, right? And I, I don't want to use it as a cop-out where with everything we say, it goes, well, it depends, but it kind of does. But at the same time, we can also come up with some sort of broad sweeping positive statements that can apply across a huge range. But again, context dependent. What are you trying to accomplish? What do you have access to? What are you reasonably willing to do? And what are your priorities, right? So if we identify those things, then we can start to make some reasonable recommendations that, that fit with, and again, if it fits your lifestyle, right? If you tell me, it's like somebody coming in and saying, hey man, I, you know, I want to work out. Give me a program. I want to work out five days a week. And you go, okay, well, how many days are you working out now? None. Like, I really want to do this though. Okay. How many days are you really going to work out? What do you mean five? No, no, no. Like really? Well, I know I can do three. Okay. so. My three-day-a-week program is going to look different than my five-day-a-week program. So let's start with what you're actually going to do. Then we can progress from there. So I think having some realistic expectations is also important in this as well. Yeah, that's some, some really amazing stuff. And you know, for, for everybody listening to this, I really want you to stop, rewind for the last 10, 15 minutes and kind of listen to that again because um, I think that that's some of the most sound advice um, that – that people often don't get or they don't understand. I mean, but to, just to summarize, and I think it, it bears repeating is, um, you know, all of these approaches tend to work. And what we look for is common themes between diff different diets and different philosophies and camps and whatnot. And we try to say, okay, what are the foundations between them? And this is why I really love the folks at Precision Nutrition with John Berardi. I respect him so much because they've really got this figured out. Um, you know, Darsh and I was talking, he, he used this, this, uh, this example. He's like, you know, when somebody is going left for, and it's working for them to get there, then they want everybody to go left with them and they forget what it's like to go right. Right. And, and, and so that's so, so important. And then to your point about the research, um, again, there's tons of confounding variables when you're looking at these different diets and, you know, and a lot of times they don't go for long enough. And so many different things with nutrition, when we're looking at long-term health, when we're looking at longevity, some of these things, the nutritional interventions you're making today, you might see dividends of that 30 years down the road. And studies don't usually go for that long. And this is why I wanted well, to have you. It's, it's hard. Like, yeah. actually, right now, a 16-week study is hard, right? Because of Absolutely. And actually, that brings us to probably one of the most important parts when it comes to diet. Here's a secret for all your listeners. I'm going to tell you what the best diet is. The best diet is the one you'll do. Yep. And that's the reality. Same thing with a workout. What's the best workout? The one you'll do. And when we when we start thinking about some of these fad diets, to me, one of the biggest problems with them is sustainability. Can you stick with it? So for example, if you're on a paleolithic diet, and by the way, the foundational concept of a paleolithic diet, let's throw the name out because really most of what they emphasize are whole foods. Right? You're like, hey, you've eliminated half the crap in your diet. No wonder you lost weight. Right. And and no wonder you feel better. Like it's a no-brainer. So we don't have to have a name for that, but still fits into if it fits your lifestyle, right? So when we look at that and we think about how that all ties together, if you if you're only used to eating grass-fed venison and organic this and organic that, and then you want to go out to eat with some friends. There's a lot of restaurants where you're not finding that on the menu. Now, what do you do? You just not eat, right? And so it's one of those things where, again, common sense goes a long way. You want to talk about metabolic flexibility. How about some attitude flexibility as well in terms of being able to do <laughs> things? You know? And so that's where I think that you can still find quality food even if it's not what was – and this is also one of the reasons why I honestly hate meal plans right? So many people write meal plans. You don't teach anybody how to eat that way. And I've actually had athletes that have told me that they were working with a dietitian who gave them a meal plan. And then they go, but then I got to the dining hall and like, I couldn't find this food. So I didn't know what to do. No, I'm not a fan of meal planning, uh, but I am a fan of planning meals, right? In other words, learning what to look for to fill your plate 
And so now you got plenty of options. And and most people would be amazed. We think, you know, athletes, they're super motivated and all this stuff. Having worked with college athletes for as long as I have, you, most people would probably be amazed at how many of them, even as seniors, don't know the difference between a carb, a fat, and a protein. Mm-hmm. They, they don't. And, and it's not their fault, you know, you know, whatever was or wasn't taught in high school or the other classes they've taken. So a lot of our, you know, sport nutrition that we deal with up front is just nutrition, right? You can't get to the sport part before they even know what in the hell you're talking about in terms of what you're trying to have them eat and why. So a lot of it's just education up front. And this applies to general population too. I, you know, I, I hate the fact that there is so much conflicting information out there. And on you know, social media and the internet are both a blessing and a curse, right? Because information is readily available, but unfortunately, a lot of very unqualified people have plenty of access to putting that information up. And if it sounds good enough and it's specific enough, my, my wife always says, the more specific it is, the more likely somebody is to think it's going to work. So if you say, if you only eat purple foods on the third Tuesday of every month, you're going to lose weight. People are going to go, damn, that sounds like it could work. I, I, I believe it. Like that is that is specific. Like that must work. And so, uh, you know, that I think that's the challenge. And when you have like Super Bowl winning quarterbacks that put diet books out because they won a Super Bowl, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that we deal with. By the way, all now that you're in Baltimore, are you a Ravens fan yet? No. Oh come on! That's like, <laughs> you're killing me. I do. I do. Li- I mean, I, I. I. But to be fair, I don't have allegiance to any specific okay. team. I'm kind of root for. I'm one of those. I'm kind of root for players. Um, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. To your point, I mean, simple's not sexy. That's what it is. That's it. You know, so uh, so nobody wants that. But but I, I, again, I, I I love having this conversation with you because again, when when people are talking about research and me being an academic and same thing with Darsh, we're looking at the science. Um, you know, again, you can find research to support whatever your hypothesis. Probably, you know, in one way or another. Because again, the, the, this goes back to the idea that hey, all of them work. You know, again, in the in the right context, and and you're producing most of that research. But I want to shift gears, and I definitely do want to talk about a little bit about intermittent fasting. Super popular. I've been getting so many questions from family members, and I think it's it's making a lot of buzz, particularly with our generation of millennials. Yeah. Hey, skipping breakfast is super easy. I'm sure athletes are doing this. You're seeing this, uh, and then we're talking about that metabolic flexibility component of it as well. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on in, in terms of. One for performance and your high performance individual, but then also, you know, what we're interested in is we're looking at this longevity. So, you know, we're talking its effects on hypertension, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular benefits, lipids, and, you know, there's, there's stuff on that as well. So yeah. where are you on this and are you doing any research in this regard? No, but you know, who is it's actually Grant Tinsley. He's done a lot of good work in this area as well. And there's some stuff going on in Europe um, with some Spanish researchers that I think is very good, but Grant's done some cool stuff in Syria. The problem is a bulk of it is not very long, like you had said, in terms of the dietary duration, you know? And so at the end of the day, most of it appears to be simply because people have cut calories. You're not eating as much. You never make up for that difference. Where intermittent fasting is useful is for people that don't want to have to think about how to restrict. But what was interesting is there's also been studies that have shown that metabolic downregulation in terms of, of metabolism, as well as weight maintenance, is actually worse on intermittent fasting than it is on sort of continuous caloric restriction where you just you, you sort of make a deficit every day versus just doing it over certain times. The other thing I would say about intermittent fasting is most people do it ass backwards and I cannot figure out why this has been the case and why it's breakfast that has to be skipped. And I blame Dr. Oz to a great degree where he's demonized breakfast, which is the dumbest. Demonized common breakfast foods, sure. Breakfast, though? No. Why does breakfast have to be French toast and pancakes and just super high carb stuff? You know, breakfast could also be a chicken breast and vegetables and whatever. So here's the deal. When you look at it, though, with most of the work that's been done, you're actually better off if you're going to do time restricted feeding, have have early time restricted feeding. In other words, eat breakfast, eat earlier, cut off the meals earlier in the day. Everybody does it backwards where they just skip breakfast. They'll drink some coffee or whatever, and then they go on. We know from a performance aspect, that's not ideal, all right? There, there's been plenty to show that now, and one of the more recent studies is, is, is really well done in that respect. And so if that, you know, and one of the most common protocols is the 8-16, right? So as you eat for eight hours, you fast for 16. Um, mine's more like a 16-8. Like I do intermittent fasting. I don't eat while I'm asleep. Um, so, exactly. yeah. Yeah. so, you know, I'm kind of in that ballpark. 
Um, I, but I, I think I, to, to, yeah. to your point about, you know, why people are doing it, I mean, I think it's just in terms of feasibility and, you know, clinically applying it to daily lifestyle. Yeah. People mostly, if you're going to stop eating at 8 PM at night and you're waking up at seven in the morning, you've already fasted for 11 hours, extended for another five. Right. Right. So it's a simple, so it's funny, right? Because it's actually, I think the reason it's been popular is because it's not um, cognitively difficult to do, right? It's math. It's like starting here, I can eat starting here. I can't. Okay, cool. Like don't have to think a lot in between. And then in between I can eat whatever I want. Mm, I'd probably argue that quality still matters in that period of time. But at the end of the day, they just never fully make up that deficit. So yeah, you're going to lose weight potentially and whatnot. But here's the thing. The reason most people really have bought into it though, is because of the promises it doesn't deliver on. It uses a lot of buzzwords and it uses a lot of um, maybes in terms of all this stuff that it can magically do. Um, so intermittent fasting is a perfect example of something in terms of the way it's marketed, not, not to say in terms of the way it works, all right? That's not fair. But the way it's marketed is it's sciency rather than science, right? So science is based in data. Science is based in, 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 in a structure of proving and disproving hypotheses, right? In terms of the way we do this. Sciency is like science with fairy dust sprinkled on it, where it sounds really good, but it's missing something, right? In other words, it doesn't translate and there's like a magical quality to it. Somehow, some way, this just works. And that's unfortunately what a lot of people are faced with with some of the nutritional guidance out there is that it's more sciencey than it is science. And if you really look at the science, you have actually a lot of options in terms of how you want to, you know, do your diet and what you want to do for it. Um, they all kind of work. The question becomes what's sustainable for you. And there is nothing particularly magic about it. Hell, you talk about, you know, it's funny with intermittent fasting, you know, we talk about the effects on, on triglycerides, on blood glucose and all these other factors, um, uh, hemoglobin A1C, like we've seen some positive effects there, but we've also seen that with We've seen that with the Mediterranean diet. We've seen that with the vegetarian diet. We've seen that with the Paleolithic diet. Hell, there's one study that actually showed the Paleolithic diet is better than the Mediterranean diet for that. Um, we've seen it with ketogenic diets, only to find out that like eight weeks later, it's a wash. And, and when you track somebody for a year, it all equals out. So, you know, again, it, <laughs> they, they kind of, well, because here's the thing if you really think about it, if somebody's overweight or obese and you guys on the physician side, you can answer me this, riddle me this, Batman. If somebody loses body fat and loses weight, what tends to happen to those markers? They yeah, get, get better. better. Yeah. And so is it the diet or is it the effect of the diet that's doing that? You know, and again, some of these things have been marketed so incredibly well and it sounds, again, it's got a name, intermittent fasting. And then you ask somebody, which one? You do the five two, the alternate day fasting, the partial fasting. You know, like what do you consider fasting? You know, and so um, you know, it's really funny. I think most of the really solid data we originally had on this was stuff that was done during Ramadan. That probably gave us our best insight into the the, the time restricted feeding. We've extended that now, but that being said, still, you know, I think if nothing else, it it's a per again, it's a perfect example of can we should we? You know, can you do it and have it work? Yes. Should you? It depends on how you do it and what you're trying to get out of it. From a performance standpoint, not something I would argue for, especially depending on when your games are, what your matches are, what your practice schedule is. Like just because you have a window cut off, does that mean you stop eating, but your game's not for another four hours? That's a bad idea. You know, so how I would apply this in an athlete model versus other would would be very, very different in that case. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think when you're talking high level athletes, again, I think that there's nuances to this stuff. And then you have to, it's like almost like micro dosing, right? Again, it's, it's the last five, 10% that you really have to, I'll give you a personal anecdote. I think that, you know, again, back, uh, I, I worked at Precy Speed School. I don't know if you know that, but uh, I also work. Yeah. So I also worked for like Jay Ferrugia. And at that time, I, you know, I, one of my uh, colleagues was a professional bodybuilder. And so with him, I was again, trying to get lean as possible. And so I went from with intermittent fasting, this is probably 2011. I went from 11% body fat down to 6%. But then at my goal was to get to around four and a half, five, but I couldn't. And then, so at some point, again, the negative effects of it 
on my performance, the stress, because it is stressful to try to skip a meal and then try to consume all your calories within an eight or six hour window. And then not only that, if you're eating late at night, there's going to be implications on your sleep quality being disrupted. And then that's going to stress you out. It's going to be this positive, terrible feedback loop. Um, But, you know, so again, yeah, to your point about, again, again, we're going back to context. First of all, what are you doing it for? Are we, are we doing it for heart health? Are we doing it for blood pressure management? That's important. And then if it fits your lifestyle, uh, if, if you are a, a high stress individual who doesn't have time in the morning because you have to get your kids ready and then you got to run out to work, maybe skipping breakfast is uh, okay for you. Maybe then you can do it. Or, that way. You find, or you find an alternate. So in other words, what else could you have for breakfast that would be quick, but nutritious from like True. a protein shake standpoint, right. something you can go with you, a Greek yogurt, you know, something Absolutely. like that. Yeah. Um, and you, you bring up an interesting thing, right? Like that stress of like, and then if you eat late at night, what about your sleep? One of the challenges, you know, and I'm almost, and I think probably here would be a cool study or something to kind of look into would be time restricted feeding. But that restriction is really more around the carbohydrate intake than it is around food intake. And the reason I say that is Mike Ormsby uh, and some others have done some really cool work on nighttime feeding. And so eating right before bed and feeding a protein bolus before bed has some really positive benefits to it in terms of muscle repair, recovery, well-being, some of the blood markers. So I guess the question becomes if you're, let's say, a bodybuilder, right, and you're trying to get down like six, seven, you know, 5%, um, is it to your advantage to not eat at night when you're now going to go this extended period of time where there is a catabolic environment, especially just the nature of dieting, you're creating catabolism. So how much muscle do you want to lose in this process versus starting to restrict when carbohydrates are taken in based on circadian responses and what you're trying to do in terms of glycogen replenishment to fuel for the next day in terms of you know entertaining that, that, that high intensity workout. So again, it's so context dependent, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I'm really curious to see the research that really should be done looking at what happens if, if you're looking at, I almost look at time restricted feeding sort of like, um, within day nutrient periodization. It's kind of the idea, right. In terms of like an off season, on season, you know, in season kind of thing, but you know, is there a time and a place for other, um, nutritional implementations then where you're looking at, Hey, during this frame of time where you would mostly be under that fasting rule, would that be a more optimal time to just have protein? Right. And then the other times a day in terms of your carbohydrate intake. And I could argue for a plan where most of your carbohydrate, especially your your high energy carbs, your more nutrient dense carbohydrate or I guess nutrient shallow, but calorie dense carbohydrate Mm -hmm. might be more around your workouts with your lower energy carbohydrates at all other times where it's mostly vegetables and things like that, that are slower processing. So, you know, have more fiber content. So even within that day, if you periodize your nutrition based on what you're trying to accomplish in that time frame, you know, and and again, I don't mean to make that sound overly complicated. It's not, it's basically like around your workouts, eat stuff that'll fuel you quickly and replenish every other time of the day, eat all of your nutritious vegetables and all that other stuff. Right. It's like, it's, it's not that hard. Yeah. No, I, I mean, again, I, I love that. And I think that's kind of probably where some of the idea of taking casein before bedtime probably developed as well. Um, but I guess from, from our perspective, you know, one of the things that I've really found interesting about this whole intermittent fasting TRE approach is um, the whole metabolic flexibility being one, right? Being able to utilize uh, fatty acids and glycerol for energy and using ketones, which we know can be beneficial for brain health if your brain can start utilizing that as well. Um, there's some literature trying to support that in terms of the cognitive benefits and Alzheimer's prevention, because I think that's an area of interest as well, um, obviously with with great implications. And then the other big one is being stress resilient. I think we're very, very prone to stress. Obviously, the the state of the world is making it that much uh, more so. And then this idea at the at the uh, molecular biological level of increased expression of you know um, antioxidant defenses and DNA repair and uh, autophagy um, and you know how how that can help with the longevity aspect of it. But again, it's the literature in that is definitely in its infancy. What, what I do want to hear about though, is you you mentioned two things: one about skipping breakfast tended to affect performance in athletes later in the day. So what's like the mechanistic thing behind it, because I think the only thing that I'm familiar with is kind of like Sachin Panda's work in the circadian code, which is a great book talking about the body's, uh, each organ has its own uh, circadian rhythm and showing that, uh, we are much more insulin sensitive during the morning than we are in the evening. Um, so again, that goes back to your point about don't skip breakfast, right? Uh, rather skip dinner, uh, yep. might be better. So, uh, so could you talk about that? 
Yeah. So, I mean, from a performance standpoint, there'll be multiple things that work here. One of which is um, obviously in the morning is when cortisol is going to be at its highest, right? That's where it's peaking as you wake up. So by taking in a meal and starting to switch to a more sort of anabolic response, you're potentially getting that in check. If you allow that to go unchecked, certainly the body's going to have to find it, – it, it's, it's kind of like Jurassic Park. Nature finds a way, right? And so you know, we, we kind of look at that and you realize that there's going to be adjustments that have to occur at the systemic level um, in order to account for that. And so even if you fully account for calories, the question is how important was that morning portion for, for glycogen storage? for priming the body for the rest of the day and not throwing you out of your normal rhythm that you would rely on. Because we know that the peak performance tends to occur a little bit later in the day, like late to mid afternoon, mid to late afternoon to early evening. Um, so now does that mean that like, that's when you should work out again, when's the best time to work out when you'll do it. Um, and in your body can't adapt to it, but if you're an athlete and you're looking to be at peak performance and, you know, ideally when would you train? It might be that situation because it's also more meals you can fit in. So some of it may simply have to do with a fueling standpoint in terms of when your body was more primed to, to metabolize it, to use it for, for later in the day. Some of it might be, as you mentioned with the circadian rhythms in terms of what it throws off or not, um, in terms of sort of optimized, non-optimized in terms of what we would get. So I think all of those things are things that are worth looking at. And I would even bring up, you know, you mentioned with, with intermittent fasting and some of the things that, that it, that it, that it can do. I would say that the autophagy has not been supported. That's actually been one of those buzzwords that gets thrown out there a lot that really, when you compare it to almost anything else, it is so overhyped. And at the same time, for most people, you go, what does it really mean? Because then like to your point with like Alzheimer's um, and, and with uh, with ketones, then I would argue, OK, so with what we see with cognitive impairment, like the ketogenic diet, really cool history of that, right? Because this mm -hmm. was back in really the 1800s, early 1900s, where um, Johns Hopkins University really pioneered this in terms of using it for kids that had um, uh, uh, seizure disorders, right? Um, and epilepsy in particular. And it had started that they realized that starvation created these ketone bodies. And so that created this less seizure response. They go, well, the problem with that is that you got to starve. So what do we have in between this? And that's where the high fat diet came in. That became repopular in the early 2000s when there was a, a special on BBC about a guy that had epilepsy that they rediscovered. And it's funny because the ketogenic diet for epilepsy purposes and for certain brain disorders has actually th – there's good medical basis for this actually. It's, but then drugs came along, and so then it fell out of the textbooks. It wasn't as popular. Oh, let's just use a pharmaceutical. And now it's kind of become popular. But what's interesting is somehow that translated from the medical utility and the ketones and what it does to um, – as a brain, brain fuel source versus glucose in somebody with seizure disorder. And then it became sort of a fitness trend, a, a weight loss trend and stuff like that. And it doesn't have the same – benefit there. So I would argue even on the intermittent fasting side, if you've got somebody where you're looking at trying to, to, to maximize the, the ketogenic response at the level of the brain for ketone use, you're probably better off using a ketogenic diet, you know, because that intermittent fasting, unless you continue with that throughout the day in terms of, you know, I mean, could you do ketogenic intermittent fasting? Absolutely. You know, you can throw a bunch of these together if you want to help. You can do ketogenic intermittent vegan fasting if you want to. Um, it doesn't sound with, fun though. With, with paleo avocados, like you'll be fine. Right. Sounds so good. yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it really just comes down to how you use it. But I, but again, I, I would just say that um, like anything else, um, if you compare it to a control and especially a standardized Western diet, it works. But if you compare it to damn near any other diet that has the same principle behind it in terms of energy restriction, there's really not that much special about it. There's nothing that unique. And, you know, and, and to our point, I, I guess my, what I would throw out there is, okay, look, if somebody is 100% sold and I got to try this intermittent fasting thing, right? I want to do time restricted feeding. Do me a favor, try it with including breakfast and cutting, cutting your calorie intake a little, you know, the later in the day stuff, and maybe even consider eating a, a bolus of just casein protein before bed. So that you still are technically in a carb fasted state, but you 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 kind of still have the 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 anabolic response going for you. There's a couple ways you can do this where you don't have to, you know, it, it it's not that difficult. No, I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to try that cutting out like the dinner because when I was doing IF before, I was skipping the breakfast, but then I realized like you know I was doing it for a year or two. I became so bloated, 
Um, okay. I guess I was just putting too much calories at like one point. And then what I switched to was, okay, I would just eat every day. And then every month I would do like a 48 hour fast. And it wasn't really so much from a health perspective. It would be a lot more just to like get back to our like animalistic self, that hunger drive, um, that discipline. I found like my meditation would be a lot more heightened. And again, to, to both of your points, it comes down to what is it for? Right. I think I think that's the biggest thing I want to take or have the listeners take away from this, as well as, you know, there's so many biohackers. Right. I put quotes on that, like coming out so many people on Instagram saying, oh, you got to do this. And you got to do this. And to your point, all we're doing is repurposing an idea and making mm-hmm. it sexy or making it fancy. Right. And I, oh. people just need to go back and look at the history of, you know, keto. And why was it there in the first place? Right. But. Yeah. yeah, we've lost a little bit of the historical context for some of these things and the scientific context for them. And, you know, unfortunately, that's where that scienciness has come in, right? Where it's like they, your point about repurposing ideas, what they'll do is it's the same shit that we've been doing, but yeah. they'll just put a new, new spin on the advertising of it. But there's nothing uniquely special about it. They just make it sound really good, you know? And people like that because people are looking for quick fixes. You know, I think Instagram is a perfect example of that. I mean, it's funny, you know, you know, all having been around the bodybuilding world, right? And having worked with the bodybuilder, it used to be so my wife was a was a former pro, IFBB pro. And um, it used to be a point at which you had to win contests and be in magazines to actually be considered a pro and whatever. And now you've got these like Instagram models that have never won a contest, have never won a pro card or anything, but but they're a fitness expert because they take some pictures. Right. And, you know, and by the way, you're not a fitness model if you're always paying somebody else to take your photos. All right. Like you know, it's one of those things where it, it's hard. And I think that that's been lost a little bit, too. Um, you know, and I think, that, again, back to our point to start this whole conversation, you know, a little over an hour ago is I'm so glad you guys are doing something like this because I think we desperately need the actual science to be put in a way and to the people that need to hear it. Like, for example, um, when I worked with coaching education with U.S. soccer, right, I love working with athletes. But if you think about it as a multiplying factor, being able to get to the people on the front lines that then can work with 10 or 20 other people, that's really the key to getting good information out there because the only way to combat bad information is with good information and helping people Mm -hmm. realize that remove the myth, remove the stigma, the overpromise stuff, the hype, and just boil down to like physiologically and psychologically, does this make sense? Because some people have to realize too that trying to adhere to these really strict diets and these these specific things you can and can't eat, like I hate that, like bad foods, good foods. There's no bad food. It's it, quantity dictates that, right? It's the dose that determines the poison. And so when you start to look at it, you know, it, it's one of those things where let's let's take the stigmas off it. Let's make people not feel bad about wanting to have a cookie. Just don't have 20 of them because that's often what happens, right? You restrict, you restrict, you restrict. And then it's like, no, I blew that. And then you're like, your whole day is gone. You're like, oh, well, you know, uh, I'll start tomorrow again. You know, it's like, no, like start the next meal. Like it, it is what it is. Like, why do you have to wait? like three days to, to get, to get back into this. So, so I think that, that really nutritionally, if you can send good messages and at least provide people, you, you, know, you can't make them do it, but you can at least try to provide the, the appropriate information so they can make a better decision. The problem is, as I've generally found, I don't know if you guys run into this is because people tend to become so tied to these ideological ideas around nutrition and diets and stuff like that is they don't listen. Right. It's in your mind. And, and, you know, like you gave a good example of like you did intermittent fasting to get down to weight. Right. And it's like, oh, I got down to like 6% body fat. Well, I can tell you a lot of people that got down to 6% not doing intermittent fasting. Right. So, in other words, it's like, and, and this is often what we deal with with ketogenic athletes, like, oh, an ultra endurance. So, this person won a race and they were a ketogenic athlete. And I'm like, great. Here's 300 that weren't. Right. In other words, they won the race on carbohydrates. And so there's always going to be that example. And that's where I think you become it becomes problematic. It's like, well, it worked for me, so it must be a real thing. And it's like it probably worked for you because you were able to stick with it. I'm not saying any one of these things is is right or wrong. Some are certainly nutritionally better than others. There's no question about that. But it really comes down to will you stick with it? You know, how does it work? But just because it worked for you. And it's just because you changed how you ate. Hell, somebody else could do a completely different diet and it works for them because it changed how they ate. They started to pay attention to what they were doing. Uh, I'll just have classified. They don't listen unless you tell them what they want to hear. 
Yes. No, you're hundred percent right. <laughs> and I think that's the, the real trick is it's starting to, you got to recognize, look, I understand why, like, I understand your why in this, in terms of why you think this way and whatever run with me on this though. Let's actually start to kind of, let's start to tear this down and really look at it in parts to put it all back together as a package. Does this really hold up to what you think or are there better ways to do this? And so, um, yeah, it's sort of like optimizing an athlete, right? There's a lot of right ways to do stuff. There's very few like optimal ways though. And so if we can identify those, you get the most out of it. But in most cases, just getting somebody to pay attention to what they're eating is the first step. It's like you can attach whatever name or whatever you want to it, but it's like, great. At least you're not just shoveling whatever in your mouth. You're thinking about what you're eating. So there's a mindfulness factor there. Absolutely. Dr. Art, you nailed our mission, right? Like our tagline is putting the health back in healthcare. And it's, it's, I feel like it's our job to educate other doctors, you know, through people like you, it's to educate the general population just to become healthier, just to open up their minds, look at things, not look at one person and say, Oh, if they did it, that means I can do it. You know, with that exact same diet, with that exact same protocol, everyone's different. Everyone's individualized. Um, I want to stay on the same topic of nutrition timing, but I want to talk about different population. Um, talking about those who are injured, either athletes or, you know, offline, you kind of talked about your mom just suffered a stroke. Um, and then defining performance, right? Because I think a lot of us have this idea of performance of going into the gym, pushing a sled, benching. Um, but what is performance to you? And, and how can that population, that uh, post-injury um, population get better in terms of, you know, what they put in their bodies? Performance is function, right? So the, the ability to move soundly, to do the activities of daily living and to optimize what's important to you, right? I mean, it's it's one of those things like, can I move as much weight as I used to? No, but I'd still like to think I'm doing pretty well. Hell, I had neck surgery 10 weeks ago now. I had two discs replaced and um, it's a process. I use blood flow restriction training quite a bit coming out of that, really nailed down the, uh, the, the nutrition and stuff like that. It was a big deal to me going into surgery, coming out of surgery, you know, and finally everything I studied was useful. <laughs> so I was like, this is great. Um, But like the other day, you know, I was finally able to get, you know, 225 across my back with a safety squat bar and, you know, bang out seven, eight reps with that, you know, back to 245 for deadlifts. I'm not where I was, but I'm better than I was yesterday, right? But to be able to do that 10 weeks out from disc replacement, I think that's performance. It's it's being a little bit better or trying to to identify what your goals are that that you want to be able to do. Have you guys seen the online ad? I think it's a German ad. And it's a Christmas ad and it's this older guy training with a kettlebell and all his neighbors are looking at him like, you need to watch it because really what it boils down to is it turns out that he's, he's, he finds this old rusty kettlebell in his garage. And so he starts training with it and he's constantly lifting it up and moving it out. And the final scene is him at his granddaughter's house, lifting her up like the kettlebell to put the star on the tree. And at the end of the day, what's your purpose? Find your purpose right? That's your performance. That's your function, you know? And so, you know, it's that ability to, to, to have that health aspect within your life, however you want to define that. And it's more than just blood markers, but it's also in terms of how you can move and how you can function within your capacity. And I think that becomes really, really important. And so the, the, the nutritional aspect of that is so highly supportive to help with recovery. We know with older adults, right? They need more protein, not less. Like they have anabolic resistance that we don't see in younger adults. So it takes a little more leucine to hit their threshold to really stimulate the overall anabolic effect. So it's all those little things that we have to think about that can go into that. And so, yeah, for me, you know, when you start to look at these, these, these unique populations and unique demands, it, it's, it's really identifying your purpose, your why, uh, and, and gearing your training towards that, you know, and even for me, God, I've been training. I started lifting when I was what, 11. Um, and so between playing sports, lifting my whole life, there's a point at which like the, just the lifting for lifting purpose, it's a little bit boring. And so there's other stuff I like to do mountain bike, surf, ski, skateboard, play soccer. So what I started to realize is I started to periodize my training around what season was coming up because it, it helped me train like an athlete again, right? Where I'm getting ready for ski season or I'm getting ready for surfing and you know, all that stuff. So it really kind of changed how I approached it now coming out of neck surgery, it's more just function to get me back, you know, because what I did is right before surgery, I did strength testing all week. I wanted to know where I was at. 
So that was my minimum that I wanted to get back to coming back from surgery, right? So once I hit that, that's my why, right? And that now I've got a, sort of a benchmark to aim for to get me back there. But the good thing is I'm operating functionally. I'm much better than I was before the surgery. So now it's just an issue of being able to get back there. But like I said, I used BFR for like the whole time in recovery. And I was able to keep my body weight within one pound of where I was at pre-surgery um, to, to maintain mu- as much muscle mass as possible. You know, you, you do, I, I probably got a little fluffy, um, because, you know, it's like one of those things where, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they're injured is, yeah, you, you, in some cases you may eat fewer calories, but here's the catch depends on what your activity level was, but also realize you need more energy to heal, right? So being able to be in that anabolic positive nitrogen balance state is critical. I definitely upped my protein intake and it was already pretty high, but I was like, all right, like whatever it takes to make sure that the repair takes, takes hold. You know, I continued with creatine, with fish oils, um, you know, all those things became really useful to me, uh, in terms of the things that help maximize function. Wow. I mean, that's, I think that's really, uh, impactful stuff. I mean, you touched a little bit about supplementation and I think no, no conversation of nutrition, uh, is complete without talking about ergogenic aids, which it's just, you know, supplementation. So I definitely, at the risk of opening up this can of worms, we want to talk about that, but I, I want to pause before we get there. And I want to talk to you about a little bit about this concept of nutrigenomics, right? I think that, you know, with, uh, with basically 23andMe and Ancestry DNA and Athlogen and Prometheus, all these folks, um, having people get the genetic code and we're starting to identify these SNPs. And I think that for the folks who, who, who don't know what they are, they're essentially these single nucleotide polymorphism and in, in, in a nutshell, it's, it's the most common way we are genetically different from each other, right? But we know that there are SNPs out there that show that some, you know, athletes that are more susceptible or more likely to be power athletes versus endurance athletes might have slightly different SNPs. Same thing when it comes to, uh, you know, predisposition to type 2 diabetes and you're in, being more insulin resistant. Um, Alzheimer's, APOE is one that's implicated in that as well as cardiovascular disease. Um, I think that a lot of that also we can, we might be able to take that data. I don't think we're there yet, but we might be able to take that data and actually start looking at what type of nutritional protocol might be optimal for somebody's performance. What, I mean, like, is that stuff that, that, that you, like, what do you know about that? Or I mean, is, have you looked at that in the lab or what are your thoughts? Yeah. So, um, I think you said that there's a key phrase. There's, we might be able to, that, 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 that we're not there yet. We're not. And I think I think the problem with nutrigenomics right now is that I, I, um, I, I think that the science is very interesting. Right. I love the science aspect of it. That's that's like the geek outside of me. Um, I do think we're overstating the findings in some cases in terms of the conclusions that can be reached, because there's some work that's been done on the power gene, you know, with the Act3N and uh, it doesn't always play out the way you would think. You know, there's mixed evidence on um, the effects uh, uh, for uh, caffeine metabolism, right? And so in a general population in terms of fast versus slow metabolizers, right. there's some evidence for for blood pressure responses and stuff. But mm-hmm. honestly, I know Nancy Guest had done a study where they found that that the um, the 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 alleles actually did um, kind of predict or determine what the uh, uh, effect was on a time trial performance. But realize these were not cyclists, right? So even your time trial performance can be impacted because then there's been a few other studies that have come out by Jojo Gerzik and a few others that have shown it may not matter, right? In other words, caffeine helped everybody. Sometimes you need a little more, a little less, whatever it is. But I think that it would be cool if we get to a point where we can identify more of these factors that might help us um, dial into the diet a little bit more. Uh, but by and large, most of the conclusions that have come out of it are not that different than what we would just normally recommend for um, performance effects. And so do I think there is the possibility that down the road, this could influence how we optimize performance and health? Yes, I absolutely do. Do I think we're there yet? No. You know, and I think that um, it, it's definitely a, a next frontier. I think that understanding some of that, what I'm afraid of, though, is that does it serve as a cop out? Does it serve uh, to artificially screen some people, especially on the performance side, if we start to use these genetic markers as evidence, whether you will or will not be an elite athlete? And there's so many other factors that go into that, but certainly the genetic code. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, right? You want to be, you want to be an elite athlete, choose your parents well. All right. <laughs> the genetics behind that definitely make a difference, but, but, you know, do I think we're, we're there yet? 
With some things, sure. I think some of the cardiovascular markers, I think we have a little better evidence for. I think in terms of the some of the risk factors on, on the brain side, I think are emerging and something that we need to pay attention to. But on the athlete side, man, I just I think it's really interesting stuff, but I have I really think we have to be very careful not to overstate the findings yeah. and start modifying how we're training somebody or how we're feeding somebody based on some very preliminary type of data. You know, and I I just think that's where it's at. Not to say that it's not promising. I just don't think we have what we think we have sometimes. How far do you think we are away from that though? Because I mean, when I, when I look at these statistics and the expectation is that at 2030, greater than 50% of the U S population is going to be obese. That's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying when we're talking about that. And so when, we, okay, so let's not talk maybe high performance athletes. Let's talk about, you know, type two diabetes and obesity and the codes for that. I mean, you, you think 10 years, you think less? I mean. So let me ask you this. Uh, and, and this is a roundabout way of answering that. I, I think 10 years, sure, reasonable, whatever. But here's my problem. Um, there's a lot we know about health now that we can <laughs> the genetic side for. And so are you going to tell me that, you know, 50% of the population has the genetic code to be obese? I mean, it's like, it's one of those things, if you look at SNPs and, and what it's doing, I think the problem is, <laughs> even if we have the information in terms of, hey, here's what you should particularly be doing, you still got to get them to do it, you know? So I really think that um, it, it's, uh, you know, because then you run the risk of somebody being like, oh, well, the reason I'm obese is, look, genetic code. Right. There you go. And so do they take ownership of other behaviors that can still help them that maybe you're never like super lean, but can you be more healthy because of these other factors? So the other thing I will say, too, and the reason that maybe I'm not as high on this as somebody some people would be. But again, not that I don't think it has promise. (laughs) The human body is complex. So which of those SNPs do we identify becomes the most important thing to target? Because, by the way, they don't work in isolation. So Mm -hmm. how many of these factors, you know, because now what do you do with an athlete who has uh, the power profile for ACT3N, but then at the same time for CYP1A, they're, you know, when you're looking at the the effects on caffeine metabolism, they're a slow metabolizer. Like, how do you start to put those things together? Like, what's your advice for somebody in that situation, you know? And so that's where I think that as we start to undefine the, one of the, my favorite parts about the human body is how freaking complex it is. But the thing I love about endocrinology is how remarkably redundant it is too. We have a lot of systems that overlap that have the capacity to make up for each other if something malfunctions, right? And so there's a redundancy in that. And I think that identifying the fact that we've got these genetic influences, great. But the question becomes, how do you parse those out and can you really look at them in a vacuum when you have all these other input variables that are feeding into the system? to create this, right? And so that's where I guess I think the the most consideration will ultimately need to be paid beyond just the ethical side of it too, in terms of what do we do? Um, but I think certainly the, the, the complexity factor and how these systems feed into each other and how they sort of redundantly influence these, these outcomes, I, I think it's something that we can't ignore. Yeah, I love that you said that. I mean, I think that ultimately that's what it comes down to. I mean, sure, you could have some snips that might make you more predisposed to obesity and all that stuff, but that's not that big mover. That's not the low-hanging fruit. That's not the reason why greater than forty percent of the U.S. population is obese right now. And but I think it's definitely an interesting discussion and stuff that we should be excited about from that science, the geeks uh, in us point. And I want to give the folks over at Wild Health uh, a shout out because they, that's this is exactly what they're doing. But they always caution that. You need a guide when this stuff comes up because like oh, you said, yeah. Arnard, it's just so complex. And my fear is that with 23 and me and Ancestry, nothing wrong with them. I have a 23 and me, but you know, people can get this information and then they, they see that and they're like, oh, oh, I have the actin 3G and I'm a power athlete. And therefore I'm going to completely overhaul my protocol, even though I enjoy running and that's the only exercise that I get. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to try to resistance tra- train, but now I'm not training anymore because I hate it. And, and so- I think that we have to be really cautious and, and I hope people can take that away from it, that we cannot allow this to dictate our practices. Let's just go back to the true and try things that we know work. Um, at the end of the day, I think that ideally we get to a point where it can inform our practices, mm-hmm. but I don't 
don't necessarily, it's sort of like, for me, it's like sports science where we've got all these technological tools and stuff like that. At the end of the day, those should not dictate how you train an athlete. They inform how you train them because you also have to take the individual into account. You know, you have to take the environment into account, the needs of the team, the coaching style, all these things play in. And so you have to make some judgment calls at that point, but you at least have objective data to utilize, to base your decisions on. Right. And then it's all in, it's all in the implementation and the context. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, Dr. Art, I, I don't know how much more time do you have left, but I, I, I do I want to talk. We're going to get bored by this point. They're like, this dude's been bored for an hour and a half. What the hell is this? <laughs> I know, but, but this is what they've been waiting for. They've been waiting for supplementation. I know that probably five times a week, more than that, somebody's texting you at some point asking you what supplement they take, any type of, and that's the first question that we get, unfortunately. Um, again, family, uh, this is what they're asking. You know, what supplement should I be taking for X, Y, Z, whatever, fill in the blank. Um, I, I mean, obviously, you have you you touched on some. You, you mentioned creatine, omega three fatty acids, fish oils. Uh, you, you talked about some branching amino acids as well in there. Um, in terms of the, now, there's a few that are have robust amounts of data behind them. Caffeine being one of them. Yeah, when it comes to per, high performance athlete, what are your base that again supplements are supplemental. We we want to put that out there, right? But when we're talking high level performance, if you want to take it to the next level, what might be some that have the best research behind them? And then maybe even for some of the lay population or, or the general population who aren't at that elite level, what would you say? Yeah, so great question. And so let me start by saying one thing that is a common misconception. I hear this from physicians all the time. I even hear it from dietitians. Supplements are FDA regulated. They are. They are regulated under a different code, though. So they're under the Deshea Act, but people are like, they're not FDA regulated. No, technically, go to the FDA site. Supplements are under there. Okay. Now, in terms of quality control and the proof of concept, that's different than pharmaceuticals. All right. But but understand that. And so there's also things that are not um, FDA approved to be considered supplements. CBD is a big one right now. Right, everybody's like pro CBD, but funny thing is, it's not actually a supplement that's approved for marketing as a supplement, um, and a lot of people mistake that. So, could you could you elaborate on that in terms? Because actually, I'm I'm probably guilty of this. So, it, it may be a little bit more what FDA regulation means and under which type of code and how that you know yeah. impacts. So, under the in the 1990s, they came out with the Deshea Act, right, Dietary Supplement uh, Act. And so a uh, supplement has to be taken orally, all right? So that, that was part of one of the classifications. But the FDA has the ability to request more information. The question is how much they enforce that. What's interesting is more companies get nailed by the FTC than by the FDA for supplement claims uh, in terms of how they do this. So you can't have a specific health claim attached to it and things like that. But but it does fall under FDA guidance. It's a, it's a subsection of FDA guidance under the Deshea Act that doesn't put it in the same category as pharmaceuticals, but it does still fall under FDA purview. And as a matter of fact, there's a couple clauses in there where they can, uh, they can require proof of efficacy and proof of safety in order to move something to market. So it has to have studies behind it in terms of, of, of clinical controls and stuff like that. So, um, so when people say supplements aren't regulated, that's not entirely accurate. It's a question of uh, how, how are they policed from the standpoint of quality control, right? You know, in terms of um, supplements that may or may not have banned substances in them and things like that. So, and, and, and again, it's not to say that that they're held to the same standard as a pharmaceutical. That's not what I'm saying, but they are under FDA purview. All right. And I hear all the time, they're not FDA regulated. No, they, they actually are. They are. All right. And so I think that's, that's something that, that's often missed. And I'm not sure how and why that started as, as sort of the understanding. And I think it's just because supplements – in some subsections get very demonized. Here's the thing. It's hard to outrun a bad diet, right? In other words, like if you have a pretty crappy diet, now that being said, there's still health benefits to So it's hard to, not that it's impossible to. I've heard some people say you can't outrun a bad diet. Mm -hmm. You kind of can, but it takes some work, right? And there's other massive health benefits to exercise regardless. Technically, you can out supplement a bad diet, right? Because if you have a fairly crappy diet and you take enough of the other supplements, you can make up some of those deficiencies. All right. Now, it's not the approach I would recommend, but you can do it. But supplements have a time and a place. And like you said, they are a supplement to the diet. So when I hear people say, oh, no, I'm whole food, no supplements, whole foods, I'm like, you can be in favor of whole foods and still recognize the value of supplement, right? Again, it's sort of like the, 
it, it, it's an either or question, right? It's 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 right. It, it's not it's not a dichotomy. It's it's like it's both. Like you can use both. So for me, creatine for sure has so much data behind it. Tremendous safety profiling. We're seeing effects for brain health. We certainly see the effects on power. We're seeing stuff for repair and regeneration following surgery, following injury. Um, there, there's a, t- a tremendous amount of interest in this. And it's funny because the one thing I always hear is like, but don't let kids take it, right? Because it's bad. I'm like, if they eat red meat, there's creatine in that. you know. But the other thing too is one of the largest um, uh, trials on brain health and creatine was actually done in kids. It was a study in New Zealand and they actually used it when when kids were admitted to the, the emergency room with traumatic brain injury, and they found that creatine supplementation in high doses actually improved their recovery, their linguistic recovery, their time spent uh, in intensive care, and all that stuff. So, you know, really cool stuff. So, actually, there's safety profiles even in kids. Um, but I think creatine's a big one. Caffeine for sure, huge fan. I'm trying to figure out how to get my lab sponsored by Starbucks. Um, <laughs> In all fairness, so I will say it for full disclosure. So I actually have a patent on a black tea extract that's been shown to improve recovery. And there's a company, Workout Coffee, that put it in their coffee. Um, so it's like best of both worlds. It's like my patent plus caffeine. This is freaking fantastic, <laughs> right? I'm totally psyched about that. Um, so that's kind of fun. They're really cool guys too. Um, but caffeine is a big one. Uh, protein, right? In terms of, you know, in terms of, yeah. Protein supplementation is an easy one, especially around training. I, I would encourage people to eat primarily whole food proteins because of the protein matrix that you get with that. But at the same time, there, there's a real value in protein supplementation, especially for athletes when you're looking at around training, right? To get to 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 restart that recovery process as quickly as possible. Um, beta alanine is sort of a next level one for me where I don't necessarily think I would recommend it for a lot of people, but there are some cognitive benefits potentially, but certainly if you engage in a lot of high intensity work, there's some benefit there from, from the standpoint of buffering acidity with the carnosine, uh, and stuff like that. So within the muscle cell, but I don't know that I'm as high on beta alanine as I used to be, but at the same time, I do think that there is a time and a place for it. And there, and there's a lot of data on it. I mean, the, the, the data on it are, are, are fairly robust. Um, it's just not a huge effect. You know, when you look at that, uh, I'm a fan of omega threes. There's some cool work in older adults, especially where they're looking at um, the, in- the impacts on inflammation and recovery. Uh, the cardiovascular benefit, I feel like, depending on which study you look at, there's been like five that have shown there's a benefit, five that show there's not. It depends on how it's screened, the dose is being used. In some cases, I think that, um, you know, people may need to take more in terms of, you know, like two to three grams a day instead of the, you know, maybe one gram that a lot of people might take. Um, but I think if you're looking at it from a brain standpoint, the, the fish oils higher in DHA are going to be ideal. If you're looking at it from an inflammatory standpoint and a recovery standpoint, EPA should be the highest component by far. Um, and they do have very different effects in that case. Um, you know, so I think those would be, uh, some of the big starting points for me, you know, creatine, caffeine, beta alanine, protein, um, and then fish oils would kind of be my, my easy five. That is five, right? Um, and, and so that's kind of where my starting point would be. There's a lot of untested stuff out there that, that sounds good in theory, but there's really no research behind it. It's one of the reasons I'm kind of proud of the black tea extract because we have clinical trial in it, data in it, as well as some animal model work. But, <clears throat> but again, you know, in terms of what people are looking for, um, it doesn't have to be super expensive. You know, creatine is actually cheap. Um, the other one, you know, what's funny. So <clears throat> the other one that I find very useful that I actually did take in, in quantities, um, post-surgery is glutamine. And I didn't do it for muscle repair as, as from a, from a muscle growth standpoint, glutamine doesn't do much where I find the most interesting data with glutamine to be is for immune function. Um, because, uh, glutamine availability directly affects lymphocyte function. And so I think that the the glutamine effects on the immune system, there's some cool work that's been done in marathoners, especially, uh, high predisposure to uh, upper respiratory tract infection and the role that high dose glutamine played post marathon in, in delay in, in, uh, preventing those symptoms, which I thought was actually pretty cool. Um, so again, maybe not for everybody, but from an immune standpoint, I thought that was pretty cool. I used to be big into like antioxidant stuff because that's a lot of the the work I did early on with antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. I'm a little less geeked about that at this point because I realized that antioxidant-wise, that is absolutely something I'd rather get from food 
because I think high dose antioxidants actually create a potential ergolytic effect because it turns out we need oxidative stress and we need inflammation in order to adapt. And so if we completely blunt that process, we run into some problems. Um, but with proper training and with dietary intake of antioxidants, we actually see an upregulation of endogenous antioxidants, which is a good thing, right? Because then from our own system, we handle that better. Um, so I think there's some interesting work that can be done there uh, in terms of endogenous upregulation. Um, and that was interesting. That was kind of one of the things we saw with that black tea that I thought was really unique. Because in the animal model, we weren't sure about the antioxidant effects, but it looked like it affected um, endogenous glutathione production. So it kind of had its – instead of it being the antioxidant, it really kind of facilitated the system's response. But we didn't continue down that pathway. I was more interested in the performance and uh, recovery effects with it more than anything else. What's the uh, what's your black tea called or the, the coffee that they're using? So it's workout coffee. Um, and the black tea, they branded it as Theofit. Because it's it's high in theoflavin content, and that's where it comes from. Um, speaking of which, I will say one other supplement that I think is really kind of cool in the caffeine vein is um, uh, uh, tea cream, uh, tea cream and dynamine. We've actually done a couple studies on this, and we got one we're just wrapping up in uh, tactical operators looking at this. But so tea cream, it's like a caffeine derivative, but it's got a longer half life but a lower peak. In other words, it's a more sustained function. But they've actually found in other research that there you don't get habituation to it like you do with caffeine. Um, so that's unique. Dynamine is faster acting, so we're actually the study we're just wrapping up, and it, we haven't looked at the data yet because it was double blind. But we're looking at whether a dynamine, tea cream, and caffeine combination is better than caffeine by itself. Because, and we're using a lower dose of caffeine in the mixture, right? So we're equating for total intake uh, when we do that. But I'll be interested to see how that plays out because the work we had done in soccer players actually did point to an improvement in some cognitive function issues, but also uh, time to exhaustion following a simulated soccer match, um, which I thought was actually pretty cool. But we'll see where some of that goes. Again, on the horizon, potentially has some utility because it also doesn't look like it has the same hemodynamic response that caffeine does. What about, yeah. what about? Uh, sorry, I'll, uh, I was going to ask, what about something like L-theanine, right? I think that has that lower peak, but goes longer. Same idea. The question becomes in what dose and stuff like that. And really, um, T-crene is, is tied to the, the, the theanine uh, molecule. So okay. you would gotcha. expect that it might actually work in concert or similarly in that case from a mechanistic standpoint. Yeah, no, that's cool. I'd be definitely be excited to see what the data shows ultimately when you sift through that. I think I just want to jump back to your point and emphasize when you talked about uh, omega-3 fatty acids and, and getting the dose. Earlier, you, you talked about how the, the dose makes the poison. And by that same token, the, the dose makes the medicine as well. And so, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I'll have people send me a picture of supplement they, they take and then I'll say, okay, send me the back. I want to look at the ingredients. Yes. And it'll have some good ingredients. Like it'll have maybe curcumin and we know curcumin is pretty well studied when we were talking about OA and pain and inflammation in that regard. But then the dose is going to be like 50 micrograms. And I'm like, well, the date, it's got to be 500 milligrams. Because curcumin's bioavailability is crap. Right. Yeah. High bioavailable curcumin in a sufficient dose. Absolutely. Because the absorption is so low. Yeah. It. But they, but that's the problem is is you'll just read the names and the names it's good these are all great but if 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 the ingredients or you know the amount is tiny then that's not what's been studied it's not really doing anything so I think that's really worth emphasizing for people. What you're, what you're getting at is what we refer to as efficacious dosing. Right. And so it's one of those things that are you following what the research says or are you just dumping the kitchen sink in there? The thing that continues to boggle my mind that I immediately will never use a supplement or have any of my athletes work with it at all is if they use a proprietary blend. Right. Because that mm -hmm. crap, because what, what, what I laugh at is when you have a proprietary blend that's like, say, six grams and they've got creatine and beta alanine and they've got caffeine and they got blah, 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 blah. And you go, OK, so let's see. Effective dose of creatine is five grams. Effective dose of beta alanine is 3.2 to 6.4 grams per day. All right, right away, you're already, it should be close to 11 grams, and you've got six total, which tells me you don't have enough of any of those things in there for it to be of any use. You're just labeling because it's been supported by research. I think we need more finished product testing. I will say, as a scientist, one thing that drives me nuts when we, you know, have done some of the finished product testing and then reviewers come back and like, well, you don't know what's actually influencing this. And so, you know, you need to study these things in isolation. It's like, but that's the point of finished product testing is how do they work in concert? 
right? How do they work when you put them together? Does this product work? It's not so much about identifying which substance is driving the, the bus in this case. It's how do they work together? Because you could even have some that potentially interfere with each other. I mean, hell, St. John's wort. Here's a fun one. Most people don't realize that St. John's wort can interfere with other medications, most notably oral contraceptives. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, things that are often left out in the in the description of that. So you have to be aware. And the other thing, too, is just being aware of other um, uh, substances that can increase or decrease bioavailability uh, of certain drugs as well, especially if somebody's on like an SSRI or anything like that, that for depression. There are some things that can affect the metabolic response there, not the least of which is St. John's wort. So you do have to be a little bit aware of some of the medical supplement interactions, which we don't know all of. You know, but certainly anything that potentially influences um, liver function, especially with anything that's the tip one A um, uh, activator in terms of some of that, or you know, even with some of these things you take with like grapefruit juice or you know anything like that, like all of those things can impact how we metabolize them too. Yeah, I'm a huge proponent of uh, f figuring out what the finished product is. I don't know if you remember, but I was actually that's where we met. I was part of a study. I don't know if it was double blind or not. Um, was it? It was. Was it you the never one? told me what it was. I don't know. I what it was, was, it, was it the one where we were training them in the gym or was it the one where they were just supplementing and doing their own training? Supplementing and doing their own training. Um, I think that was like stimulate. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah. Yeah, that was like all the rave. I, and I've never – it was like a year that it lasted. It was all over the place. And I was like, this looks like it – um, but, uh, yeah, that was a, a miserable experience in, in terms of checking her VO2 max and doing the wing gate test, which I would not recommend on anybody. It's a, it's a hard experience. I remember my roommate would, uh, would be throwing up every single time. <laughs> it's not fun. Yeah, wing gates are rough, man. That's yeah. A, I'll never forget. Were you, so were you in the lab when Alan Walker started with me as a master's student? I don't think so. No, okay, I don't remember. Alan came in. <laughs> so Alan is a faculty member at Lebanon Valley College now and just killing it. He's great. So he graduated with his PhD from me at Rutgers uh, before I left. And um, I remember it was hilarious. We got a new Velotron in one day. I get a text from him and he's like, I learned two things today. The Velotron works. Number two, it's a bad idea to eat Chipotle before doing wind games. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the, you're a grad student. What were you thinking? I'm like, that was that was the highlight of my day. I'm like, you got to be kidding yeah. me. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Patrick, Patrick, David, and Devin were there yep, when I, right. during my senior year, at least when I was interns. And uh, so that they, they I think, I think Devin's out somewhere in the West Coast now. Oh, from Devin right. moved back east, but she actually started her own business. She got out of academia, and so she has her, has her own consulting business. She's actually helped a lot of programs start nutrition programs. Love it. She's worked with some schools in Philly, um, and then Pat is actually on faculty at uh, uh, the college, University of the Sciences in Philadelphia now. So he oh, was okay. up. There. He was up at Mercy College in uh, uh, New York, Connecticut area, and then now he's down in Philly there. And apparently, he's back working with Rutgers football now that Shiano's back because Pat was working as their uh, team nutritionist. So I think they brought him back um, for for the season. I don't know what he's going to do after this once they actually have to be back in person at his actual university. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so so my understanding is, you know, that's what both of them are doing. So it's actually pretty that's good. I'm I'm glad to hear they're on, they're on the East Coast again. I want to ask you a quick follow up on creatine. Uh, it's creatine monohydrate. You talked about it's cheap. It, we know it works. Yep. Um, I, I think that for, for again the power output, muscle hypertrophy, those are the main thing that's been studied. What about athletes? Because I know you work with athletes, like fighting athletes, where w cutting weight is a is a big thing, and you, you know a lot of times these athletes are dehydrated. Um, that compounded with the risk for kidney injury. Um, I mean, is that something, I mean, how do you, is that one type of athlete that you don't recommend creatine in or? No, well, actually we do. What we do is, uh, in their weight cutting week or just leading up to it, we'll, we'll back off on the dose of creatine. It's not going to fully wash out of the system. And so we won't get quite the same degree of water retention, but if you're smart about how, so, and this is, this is my thing too, is, um, you also have to be smart about how you're getting to weight during the camp, right? Because ultimately we don't want a huge weight rebound after weigh-in to a point where they're now heavier than they've been training at. Um, so how we manipulate that becomes important. But like with one of the fighters we worked with that wound up winning a title, um, he actually, when we were going to water load him and then cut um, the week leading up to the fight, we cut the creatine back, but then we reloaded right after he weighed in. So we did 20 grams over the next few hours to, to resaturate from that standpoint because he hadn't lost it completely. And he wound up doing great in the fight, obviously won the title. But, um, you know, so so it's not a group that I don't recommend creatine for, especially because the cognitive effects of it and, and potential protection from brain injury, TBI in particular, is 
becoming pretty notable in terms of as a, as a possibility. I think there's still some some research to be done in that for sure, but it's promising. And I'll tell you what, if you're getting bounced in the head, you know, over and over and over again, um, I would rather err on the side of having creatine than not. Um, because we know that from, from the TBI and concussion mechanism, it's not so much about cellular damage as it is energy disruption. And so because creatine can cross the blood brain barrier, it actually provides the energy intermediate when that gets disrupted with a head blow. Um, and so I think that's where some of the really cool work, it originated some of the work at Michigan State in an animal model. Um, you know, we're now looking at maybe potentially doing this in, um, in military personnel uh, as a potential prophylactic, especially for those that are prone to, to blast concussion uh, when they're charging through doors and stuff like that. So those are some of the areas I think that are that are uh, on the horizon, and I think there's been some work in Huntington's in Huntington's and in um, Alzheimer's uh, and Parkinson's for the role that it may play as well. Just to clarify, though, we're talking creatine monohydrate, right? Because I know there's other formulations like ethyl ester, and people who market all that. I mean, garbage. Good old awesome. monohydrate, man. It's I still haven't seen anybody really improve on it. And some of the other stuff actually doesn't work, um, but it, it's cheap. It works. It's the most researched. And not to say that maybe somebody won't come out with something that absorbs even better, but honestly, the absorption rate of creatine monohydrate is really good. Um, you don't need to load. You can. So if you're not taking creatine, you know, taking 20 to 25 grams, I would split that up in multiple doses. Otherwise, you get stomach upset. Um, but you only need that for four or five days, and then you can just go to five grams per day. Um, we're really looking at like three to eight grams per day. Five is kind of an easy one for everybody to do. It's usually like a tablespoon. So, um, pretty easy and, uh, and there's multiple benefits to it in terms of cognition. And, and I would definitely say if you're vegan or vegetarian, take creatine because they're the group that tends to be most efficient where the cognitive benefits have been most pronounced with supplementation. Absolutely. No, this has been, this has been fantastic. And speaking about the future of research, I mean, you know, I've learned so much already just under two hours here. Is there anything that you're really looking forward to, you know, in the next year, five years, 10 years, something that you might be working on or something that you're just excited that the field is now going to uh, pop out some studies? Is there anything that you're really looking forward to? Honestly, I love the, the, the work the field is doing in general. I'll always be excited about the role that monitoring can play in terms of helping to establish. You know, we talked about, you know, the, the nutrigenomics and some of the, the measurables there. But at the same time, some of the, the information we already have from, it, from an athlete and person monitoring standpoint to help achieve more optimized health and fitness and function, I think, is really key. That includes biomarkers. That includes wearables. You know, I think there's some really cool stuff. It's, it's really one of those assess, don't guess kind of ideas, right? And yeah. then... The other thing too is, you know, our lab has been very interested for a while on the female side of things. And I think it's an area that really needs more exploration. And I think people like Kirstie Elliott Sale over in the UK are just killing it in this area. Uh, Kate Ackerman here in, in the Boston area, like, you know, there's some great work that's being done. And that's something that we want to continue to contribute to. And we're interested in now moving that to female military because of the challenges they're having passing the new army on that the, the new army combat fitness test. And so we're looking at ways to optimize their training, their preparation and stuff like that. Um, and really some, some alternative training models uh, for how we're doing this. We're you know doing a study with the Marine Corps now looking at their gender integration model for boot camp, uh, where we've got physiological and sociological measures included in there. Um, we've got this work that, that's starting with an army grant um, where we're going to be doing blood flow restriction training and minimal equipment training uh, to look at what can be done in a field and very portable <clears throat> in order to facilitate um, uh, recovery aspects, but also when they don't have access to a lot of heavier equipment, you know, sandbags, weighted vests, stuff like that. TRX. Um, so those are some of the things that we're looking forward to. Um, you know, some of the work that's even being done in our department, everything from youth physical activity and obesity to community health, to cardiovascular health, to, uh, we're getting ready to start a study in, um, uh, looking at sickle cell trait and, um, care discrepancies between HBCUs and other NCAA, uh, colleges in terms of care for the black athlete that might be, you know, that has the predisposure for this. Um, so I just, you know, and, and cancer, exercise and cancer is definitely a hot topic, right? Mm -hmm. We've got a faculty member here, Kieran Fairman, who we just hired, who, who does great work in that area. Um, so I'm excited, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely partial to the work done at university of South Carolina. Um, <laughs> Time. I just think there's great stuff going. I know Sarah Campbell and others in the field doing some work in the in the microbiome uh, and and its impacts on you know gut health and and both obesity, performance, and all these things. And we have a position stand I'm on with um, uh, ISSN on both the microbiome, but then also probiotics 
you know, I think those are some areas of interest going forward in terms of where we might see some of this. So, you know, there's a lot to be excited about. Horizons, yeah. yeah, it is. And, you know, for us, it will always be founded in, in stress and optimization and, and looking at ways to, to facilitate that. You know, we're continuing to work with the athletes at South Carolina um, and looking at things even related to heart rate variability across the season and some of the loading changes uh, and even some some strength discrepancies, intralimb discrepancies that, that that occur with fatigue that might explain some of the injury mechanisms. So, you know, those are those are fun areas for us, right? We'll always do, you know, hopefully we'll always have something in the works with supplements, you know, and stuff like that because I do find that to be, uh, you know, an area that needs more research because it's always funny, right? I will say, and this is where we need the physician's help in terms of messaging, it, as there's no research behind that. Then when there's research behind it, they criticize it because a company sponsored it. And it's like, guys, a lot of this stuff is not what um, NIH is, is paying for, right? So they're not sponsoring a bunch of stuff, especially in high performance stuff. So I think that you know one of the, the messages going out there is judge it less on who funded it and more on the design. You know, because at the end of the day, and we have a lot of disclosures, you know, that we sign, but we we reserve the right to publish. It might be that we have to take a trade name out of it or something like that. But, you know, the data are the data. And I think that having research in this area is critical. And I think that if people are going to be like, hey, we need more research in this area, don't just immediately criticize the research that's been done because somebody's willing to pay for it. So I think I think that's a, a challenge we often face. Dr. Art, uh, I think that despite the fact that we have been talking just under under two hours. This is, I mean, I think we've just scratched the surface um, on, on the things that we can dive into nutrition. And, and uh, you know, we didn't even, like you said, we didn't even get into really what your area of expertise is, which is many uh, of exercise, endocrinology, and those types of things. And I, I told Darcy uh, offline when, when you weren't here is, you know, um, you made me actually fall in love with endocrinology. And I, for a long time, I was going through medical school and and I thought that I was going to be an endocrinologist, uh, but then one of my buddies, a close friends, but like, if you do endocrinologists, you're probably going to be taking care of a lot of diabetes and you're not going to be dealing with growth hormone disorders and those kinds of things. So I decided I can go down the sports medicine aspect and, and do uh, endocrinology that way instead. Well, yeah. um, we uh, we want to thank you so much. Uh, you've well, been a mentor for me for such a long time. And uh, uh, this just means that we, we got to get you back on here again and have yeah, this conversation. But honestly, man, coming from me, that means a lot. I'm really excited to see the stuff you guys are doing and all. I'm, I'm really, I, honestly, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I'm really proud of you. Um, so it's really been my pleasure to be on. I'm happy to have more ongoing dialogues or point more people in your direction for you to interview people that, you know, that I really respect, that I think make for good interviews, that have some really cool data and stuff like that. Because I think what your, what your mission is and what you're trying to accomplish, I think, is a good one. And I know as a field – we are more than happy to contribute to that because we need those voices to help bridge that gap that often exists. Um, and I, I think that's where, you know, that, that becomes a real consideration. So, um, yeah, you guys, you guys have been fantastic and I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, definitely looking to forward to more of these if we have them. Awesome. Thank you. you Such a great show with Dr. Art. Before we end, let's give you the link for our sponsors again. If you need help reviewing your employment contract before you sign, reach out to a company with great online reviews and reputation for doing that and more. Find Resolve at www.drpodcastnetwork.com slash resolve to get the review process started today. As always, guys, remember everything in this podcast is to be considered general information only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine and we are not providing medical advice. No physician-patient relationship is formed, and anything discussed in this podcast does not represent the views of our employers. However, if you enjoyed the content, please make sure to subscribe and share with anybody you think will benefit from this. We'd love to hear your thoughts, and we want to keep bringing you more content like this. Until next time.